Good morning. Welcome to the second day of the 2015 Virtual Genealogy Fair. My name is Andrea bassing Matney, and I am the Community Outreach Programs and Support Specialist for Research Services at the National Archives, broadcasting from Washington, D.C. A few quick notes before we start. Because we are a live broadcast, speakers will answer questions at the end of their talks during the question and answer time. You can submit questions for a speaker from the YouTube chat page, or you can send a Twitter message to hashtag GenFair2015. Next, for captioning, please open a separate browser window and go to the 2015 Virtual Gene Genealogy Fair webpage. From there, you will find the schedule and handouts. Locate the current session and click and open its captioning link. Finally, the video presentations and handouts will remain available on the Virtual Genealogy Fair webpage after the event. From our website, you can also find previous Genealogy Fair presentation material. Today, we begin our second day of the 2015 Virtual Genealogy Fair with session number six. It's entitled, Where'd They Go? Finding Ancestral Migration Routes by Gene Nudd. Our ancestors were mobile and families moved, sometimes across an ocean, but just as often land routes to the western frontier. Where they went, how they got there, and why they moved adds flavor and depth to our family research. This lecture outlines some of the federal and local records that you could use for this research. Ms. Nudd is an archivist for research services at the National Archives at Boston. I am now turning the broadcast over to Jean Nudd. Good morning. Today we're going to learn how some federal records, along with your family and local documents, might help you discover not only where your ancestors moved, but sometimes even how and why they moved. So what do we need to know to get started on this research? Well, I found that knowing either where the family started from or where they ended up is the most useful piece of information. Most of the families that I've traced, I've known where they ended up and had to trace back where they came from. Where the family was in 1880 uh, through 1930 can help because, of course, the census will tell us not only where they were born, but where their parents were born during those years. Did they travel alone? Did they own land anywhere? And finally, if any of them were in the military involved in a war, that can also get us started. Slide four. So what records do we use to answer these questions? Well, first, we're going to look at family records, as well as published materials like letters, diaries, genealogies, town and local histories, local records like deeds and probate files, city directories, and cemetery records. Yes, even cemetery records. One of the uh, gravestones I found for my ancestor, Jacob Goodman, said that he immigrated from Germany in 1806. Federal records such as census, land, file claims, military, pension, and naturalizations can also give us clues. Sheet, uh, slide five. So using the census in migration, how does it help us? Well, as I said, the 1880 to 1930 census not only gives us where our ancestor was born, but where their parents were born as well. The 1870 census asked, for the males in the household who were naturalized. So you'll get a check mark on the right side under that column if your ancestor, sometimes it's just a slash, became were uh, citizens if they were born outside the United States. The 1830 census asks if there are aliens in the household, and once again that information is on the right-hand side of the page. 
even pre-1850 census can provide useful information, and we'll look at those in just a couple of minutes. Slide six. What types of land records? Well, at the local level, you're going to find deeds. Of course, wills can sometimes have information about land ownership as well. Federal land records include homesteads and purchase of government land, as well as bounty lands, which were given for service in the military. Slide seven. What do we want to know? Well, I don't know about you, but I don't just want to know where they started out and where they ended. I want to know why they moved. I also want to know how they got there. What routes did they take? Um, I found in my research that this can uh, influence family relationships that can show us where they met other people, other members of the family, uh, and so it can also show us where our lines are interconnected. Slide eight. How are we going to find these pieces of information and put them together? Well, we're going to use family and local records to find out all we can about where they started out or where they went and maybe even how they got there as well as why, we're going to find them on the census because that will give you clues that you can follow up. Did they own land? Well, the 1850, 60, and 70 census gives us real estate values, so that can tell us if they own land. If the father fought in the war, some of the census can give us clues about that as well. And don't forget to check neighbors and collateral family members. This can help you find out where, what, when, and why. Slide nine. This is probably a very basic example for most genealogists who have found family in the census. Just remember that we not only want to find them in the 1880 forward census, we want to find them in every census in which they are numerated because we all know how accurate the census can be. So we want to check more than one year. Even for families that moved a relatively short distance from one neighboring state to another, the census can help us find out when and where. For example, let's look at Israel Goodman. Slide 10 is actually my mother's maternal great-grandfather, Israel Goodman. He was a mason. Slide 11. On the 1860 census, we see all the children were born in Ohio except Elizabeth. You can see he's right at the top of the page. And as I said, we see value of real estate. So we know that Israel owned land. He has $600 in real estate value. Slide 12. So Israel had a child born in Ohio in 1846, 1849, 1852, and 1854. His next child, though, wasn't born until 1857, and Elizabeth, that last child, was born in Iowa, not in Ohio. So therefore, we can deduce just from that one piece of information that Israel left Ohio to go to Iowa sometime between 1854 and 1857. Here's where local records can be very useful. I was out in Delaware, Ohio a few years ago, and I went to the Delaware County Records Office and located a court record involving Israel where he sued someone. He was a mason, and someone didn't pay him for the brickwork that he did, so he sued them, and the suit wasn't settled until about March of 1857. So now I know that they were still in Delaware, Ohio, until at least March of 1857, so probably Elizabeth was pregnant during the trip to Iowa. Can you imagine walking across country when you're pregnant? Slide 13. If we look a little closer at Israel Goodman, we see on the 1860 census, as well as the 1850, that he was born in Pennsylvania, not in Ohio. So if we check some earlier censuses, we may have found out when he went to Ohio from Pennsylvania. And remember, people don't generally move alone. Usually when they migrate, they migrate in groups. And these groups can be something such as location. They may have all come from the same area. It can be religious. It can be ethnicity or cultural or even a family relationship. Slide 14 shows us the 1850 census with Israel Goodman. He's right in the middle of the page. 
Mason, born Pennsylvania. His wife, Elizabeth, is born in Ohio, as are his sons, Samuel and Charles. Right underneath Israel, we see Franklin Goodman, also a Mason, also born in Pennsylvania. Can I presume this is his brother? Well, further research proved that it was. And in that household, we have at the bottom Rosanna Goodman, age 64, born in Pennsylvania, who turned out to be his mother. When I look further in the 1850 census, I also find an Adam Goodman. Guess what? He was also a Mason, also born in Pennsylvania. And I find a Levi, also a Mason, also born in Pennsylvania. And in Levi's household, I find a Jacob Goodman, who's a Mason, born in Germany, age 72. So it appears that his parents were not living together in 1850. Slide 15. So we know Israel did not immigrate to Ohio as an adult because he obviously in 1840 was still a child. So the 1840 census does show Jacob Goodman and the family, but he isn't on the 1830 census in Ohio. So how do we find out where in Pennsylvania the family came from? Looking at collateral research, this group that may have moved all together will do the trick. Slide 16. So how do we do this? What methodology are we going to use to find this information out? Now, this is in a one, two, three project, and you're done. This is going to take a while to do. First, you check the 1850 census. Of course, it's a lot easier now that all of this information is online. When I first did this research, it wasn't online, and I had to go through it all by microfilm. So we check all of the 1850 census for Delaware, Ohio, looking for people who were born in Pennsylvania. Next, we go back to 1840, and how many of those surnames are still there? And then in 1830, we look for that same cluster of surnames in Pennsylvania. So let's see what I found. Slide 17, the left column is 1850 Delaware, Ohio. You see there's quite a few people born in Pennsylvania who are living now in Delaware, Ohio. In 1840... About half of them are there. And it quickly, I discovered when I went to 1830 in Pennsylvania, first of all, there weren't a lot of Jacobs. There were, most of them that I found were in Berks County. There was one or two who were outside of Berks County, and I looked for them in the 1840 census, and they were still in Pennsylvania. So I could immediately rule those out as not being my Jacobs. But when I looked at all the surnames in 1830, if you look down the list, Redding, Southwest Ward, Redding, Southwest Ward, Redding, Southwest Ward, Redding, Southwest Ward, are you getting the impression that a lot of people from the South Ward of Redding moved out to Delaware, Ohio? Right, so this is where I figure they must have come from. Now, I wrote an article, and I'd be happy to send it to you. If you send me your email address, you... It's entitled Using Pre-1850 Census to Find Family Relationships, and that goes into further how I figured out that this was the right family. Slide 18. So this is a conclusion. I'm concluding that they probably came from Berks County, South Ward of Reading. Further research is needed. Story from the family tell me that John Franklin, he was supposedly born in Maxitani, Berks County, and Israel supposedly also was born in Berks County. What I found out about Rosanna Sophia Troutman is pointing to her place of birth at Philadelphia. So it looks like this was a very mobile family from the beginning. Slide 19. Let's see if we can do this with a little more complicated example. Gideon Spencer Wells was born in Vermont in 1809. He married a woman from Forestville, New York in 1834 and ended up in Wheatland, Michigan in time for the 1840 census. Why leave Vermont for Michigan? Not that I'm prejudiced. Born and raised in New Hampshire, 
Vermont's a really neat place. Why would you leave? What route would you get to take to get there? That's a long distance in the 1830s. And why Michigan rather than some other Midwestern state? Slide 20. I am lucky enough to have in my possession a family history written by one of Gideon Spencer Wells' sons. And I have a box there in the middle of the page that shows you in about midway down in that box, this son wrote that from this Michigan home during the fall and winter, about 1845 or 46, a visit was made to relatives in New York and Vermont, the trip being in an ordinary farm wagon drawn by a bay and white team. The writer with his older brother Gilbert was left in Knowlesville, New York, with their maternal grandmother while our parents made the balance of the trip to Vermont and returned. So we know he had a farm wagon. He would have to. You have to take everything. You can't. uh, It's not like today where you can go to your local Home Depot. Slide 21. So I know he was born in Peachum, Vermont. His first wife was from Forestville, New York, which is right by Lake Erie. His mother-in-law lived in Knowlesville, New York, which is near Lake Ontario. And I found her there on the 1840 census, not on the 1850. His second wife was from Geneva, Ontario County, New York, which is on the Seneca Lake Canal, and he married her in 1852. He died in Wheatland, Michigan, and let's see how he got there. Slide 22. I don't know about you, I love maps, and they're very useful and showing us some of the things that they might have had to use or some of the hardships they might have encountered on their trip. Now, what's in the way here? He starts out there at the top right in Peachum, Vermont. Ooh, all the way down here to the bottom left is Forestville, New York, and right in the way to get to Michigan is Lake Erie, slide 23. The history, the family history that his son gives me shows me that in 1834, they're in Forestville, New York. In the 1880s, they're in Wheatland, Michigan, from whence his son James leaves and goes to Kokomo, Indiana, then to Woodstock, Illinois, to Webster City, Iowa, which is where my grandfather was born in 1884 and then to Shell Rock, Iowa, by 1893, where the youngest child was born. Slide 24. Why? Well, in order to answer the question as to why, we need to look at some local research. We can't just depend on family records. Slide 25. There are lots of sources for historical facts on Vermont. And these are what I used to find out why. Slide 26, why leave Vermont? Well, it turns out in the research that I did that between 1830 and 1840, somewhere around 50 to 60% of all of Vermont's population left the state. That's a huge amount of, to lose. But Vermont's a very small state, and it turned out that by the 1830s, a lot of their natural resources had been obliterated because of all the people living there. There there was no more land. All the land was owned. A large number of small acreage farmers were selling out to larger farmers because there was this huge wool boom, and wool was a big product in Vermont. And, of course, this is the beginning of the time period when newspapers are regaling the praises of the West as a place for cheap, fertile land and a healthy climate. You've got to remember this is the time period when the federal government wants to sell all this land that it owns because it's just bought the Louisiana Territory. Slide 27. So now we're going to do it in reverse. What we did with Jacob Goodman, we're now going to do with the Wells's, but we're going to do it the other way around. So in 1820, in Peachum, Vermont, I find Wells, Shaw, Robbins, Johnson, Gregory, Eastman, Bailey, and Burbanks. 
And guess what? In 1840 Wheatland, Michigan, I also find Well, Shaw, Robbins, Johnson, Gregory, Eastman, Bailey, and Burbank. It's before 1850, so I don't know where those surnames originated, but I'll bet you they went together because then I go to www.gloRecords.blm.gov. Let me say that another way, www.generallandofficerecords.bureauoflandmanagement.gov where they have a database of all the land claims, all the land purchases of public lands. And I find all of those names buying land in Hillsdale in Genesee Counties, Michigan. Wheatland is one of those places that changed counties over time because as Michigan was settled, county boundaries changed. Slide 28. What do you suppose were the routes that he might have taken? Well, in this research that I read when I was reading these books, I found out that a lot of Vermonters went west on an all-water route, steamboats to Whitehall on Lake Champlain, packet boats to Troy, Buffalo, even Detroit, Cleveland, and Green Bay, Wisconsin. Railroads were springing up and heading west. Unfortunately, a lot of them were just spurs. You don't have a long line like we do today that goes from coast to coast. And post roads, there was a big network of post roads. Post roads are the, are the roads that the federal government built to link one town to another so that the mail could be delivered. These people often took them west, through the, and this went through the Berkshires in western Massachusetts, which was a western gateway. Slide 29. When I was doing this research, one of the things I did, I love Google. I Google everything. And in Googling, I found a diary by a man named Roswell Henry Wells. I got all excited, a Wells, oh boy. Turns out he's not my family. But he wrote in his diary that they went west to Michigan through Detroit in 1854, and then they took a stagecoach. Stagecoaches hadn't even occurred to me. Slide 30. I also found an article by Kip Sperry, who's a very famous genealogist, and he wrote an article on tips for finding migration routes, which you might find useful. Slide 31 is another map, and this shows you the railroads in occupation, in operation in December of 1840. Now, as you can see, most railroads are very short. We have one here from Troy to Auburn, New York, uh, very short. Nashua, New Hampshire to Boston. Um, and then we have Little Spurs, and out west we also, there's no connections. Slide 32 shows us canals, waterways. You have Lake Champlain. You have a canal that goes out the Mohawk River out into Buffalo. You have one that goes south from Utica um, to Binghamton and further south. So canals won't get him all the way there either. Slide 33 shows us the post roads. And as you can see, there's tons of post roads he could have traveled. Remember, he had to take everything he needed to Michigan with him. And if you don't know about post roads, slide 34, when you go to the National Archives catalog, we have a whole lot of records about post roads. Slide 35, the top shows us what types of records we have about post roads, what the dates are for them, uh, how large the collection is, and it also describes some of the records. Slide 36, so why Michigan? Why not somewhere else? Well, first of all, cheap land. The Federal Land Sales Act passed in April of 1820. We can go to www.glorecords.blm.gov and have a searchable database of these records. Slide 37. So I thought you might like some information about land records. So I gave you, give you here on slide 37 some definitions. Uh, public land states. We only have the sale of federal lands 
in states where the federal government owned land, obviously. And if, when we think back, our history coming to life here, the 13 colonies, the federal government didn't own any land in the original 13 colonies. So if you have someone who moved from New Hampshire to Virginia, this isn't going to help you. The land entry papers are the records of the transactions that show the legal rights of the person to that land. The patent is what guarantees the land. It's like a private title. Slide 38 is a listing of all the public land states. And as you can see, the one that's the furthest east and the only one there in the east is Florida. Slide 39 shows you when these acts were passed. So the credit, believe it or not, the federal government actually sold land on credit for 20 years, from 1800 to 1820. In 1820, it went to all cash, no cash, no land. And then we get the Homestead Act in 1862, the Timber and, and uh, Desert Lands Acts as well. Slide 40. What information are you going to get from these land claim files? Before Homestead, you're not going to get a whole lot of personal information. The credit, the cash, the preemptive give you the name of the person, the residence at the time of purchase, the date of purchase, the number of acres, a legal description of the land. Uh, you probably get a receipt for the payment. That's about it. You're not going to get a lot more than that. 41, the homesteads show us a lot more. A homestead is going to give you some biographical information. Uh, they had to prove that they were a U.S. citizen. They had to um, show marital status, and children. They had to have witnesses who attested that they had improved the land. So you're going to get more from a homestead than you will from a purchase. Slide 42, the Timber and Desert Lands Act. Again, you won't get too much information from those. Slide 43, here's the official uh, federal land record site. And if you look there on the top left, you'll see Search Land Patents. That's what you're going to click on. Slide 44 takes you to the search engine. You need to know what state you're looking in. You need to give them a surname. You've got to have that last name in there. And then you can hit search. And when we look for Gideon, slide 45, we get two hits. He didn't just buy land once. He did it twice. If you click on the name, slide 46, it takes you to the information sheet about that land purchase. You can see here on the left when he bought the land, May 1st, 1839. He went to the Kalamazoo Land Office and under what authority? The uh, Land Sale Act. And the right-hand side under document numbers, now this is the information you need in order to request the record online from the National Archives. The survey tells us that he bought it in Michigan and it was 80 acres. Slide 47 gives us a physical description, the legal description of the land, township range. Slide 48 is the top of the patent. And as you can see, this is for the second purchase. And we see that he's from Seneca County, Michigan. And slide 49, we look towards the bottom, it tells us that he bought this land in 1839. Slide 50. This is the first purchase. We see that he went to the Genesee Land Office this time. He bought the land September 5th, 1839. This time he's buying 120 acres. Slide 51. This patent shows us that Gideon Wells is still living in Orleans County, New York. So we get a residence. We know exactly where he is in 1838 when he bought this land. The bottom, slide 52, once again tells us when he did this, the fifth day of September, 1838. Slide 53, this site also has Patent plat maps on 
so you can actually see on a plat map where that land is. So this is the first purchase. Slide 54 is the second purchase. And slide 55, at the bottom of the plat map, it gives a description of the land they bought. And when we find the, it, on the right, you've got township, on the left column, excuse me, you've got township and range. When you find the one for Gideon, its description is bush, brushy, fallow, timberland. So he definitely would have had to have everything he needed before he got there. Slide 56. Remember we talked about real estate values. Here on the 1850 census, you see Gideon towards the bottom of the page. He's a farmer, and he's got $1,200 in real estate, which he paid $220 for. Slide 57 is the 1870 census. Here he's in the middle of the page. And down below him, the second from the bottom, you see Thomas Johnson right next door to him. It's someone who came from Peach and Vermont. But Gideon's real estate is now valued at $3,600. Slide 58. I actually ordered these land claim files from the National Archives. So this one you can see, maybe you can't read it, um, about the, it's 22.340 at the top right here from Kalamazoo. It gives you the patent number, and then it tells you May 1st, 1839, which tells us that this is the second one. Slide 59. Here we have the legal description as well as the receipt for the land. You can see 80 acres at the rate of $1.25, $100. Slide 60. Here's the patent. We already saw this once on the website. It says the same stuff. Gideon S. Wells, Seneca County, State of Michigan. Slide 61 is the bottom of the patent, just like we saw before. It gives us a legal description of the land and the first day of May down towards the bottom, 1839. Slide 62, here we've got the first one. Again, in about the middle of the page, you see September 5th, 1838. That tells us this is the first purchase of land. 63, here's his receipt for $150, so he didn't pay $220, he paid $250. And it gives us a legal description of the land. 64, here's the patent. Once again, Gideon S. Wells of Orleans County, New York. 65 is the last page of the patent. Slide 66. I couldn't resist. I had to find, look and see if there were anybody from the other side of my mother's family who might have bought land, and I found a James Park in Iowa, and lo and behold, my parks were from Iowa, late of Iowa, and this actually turned out to be the brother of my park. 67 shows us the patent again for James Park purchase in Iowa. 68 is the back of that patent. 69. Let's move from land to military records. How can they help us find migration routes? They can probably be almost the most useful thing that we have because it tells us where a man enlisted and where he was discharged and even sometimes where he got his pension. It may be different. This information can help us with these migration patterns. Slide 70. Let's take the case of Andrew Park. He was born in 1824, which at that time was Blackswell, Mogangali County, Virginia. He enlisted at the Army in Lafayette, Indiana in 1847. He was just discharged from the Army at Jefferson Barracks, Missouri in 1849, and he died in Indianola, Iowa in 1894. Slide 71. Oh, here I go with the maps again. The Right side of the arrow is Blackswell, Mogangalia County. It's not really an arrow, it's a line. The right side, the left side is Lafayette, Indiana. It's just the beginning 
of Andrew's migration. 72. The National Archives holds a register of enlistments in the U.S. Army. This is a chronological and alphabetical record. Slide 73. When I go, I know he was in the Mexican War, so I know he enlisted in the 1847-48 time period. So I go to those rolls of film, or I believe it's online now, so it's not anywhere near as hard to search. And then I go to the P's and look for Park, and you see Andrew Park there, and then it tells us he's 22, he has hazel-colored eye, brown hair, fair complexion, born in Virginia, he's a farmer. On the right side of the page, we get his enlistment information. Slide 74 It's the second half of this. It's a it's a these were our books that actually cover one person covers both the left and the right hand page. The left column tells us the company he was in, and then we get the discharge information, including date and place and cause, and then we have remarks that tells us Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. Slide seventy five. I got his pension record from Washington. Here we see it tells us that he was discharged at Jefferson Barracks and when, and it also tells us that he was in Mexico 60 days during the war. Slide 76 is the claim of the survivor. So this is from his wife's portion of his pension file. It gives us, again, the Jefferson Barracks information and his date of discharge. And what I found most interesting, we have a little box here around... The fact that when he was discharged from said service, he then resided as follows. Kokomo, Howard County, Indiana, until September of 1851, and then he came to Indianola, Warren County, Iowa, where he resided ever since. Slide 77. Why did he go to Iowa? He had a very good reason. He got a land warrant for his service of 160 acres. Unfortunately, they didn't remember the number, but that's okay because when I look them up, we'll we'll get there. It tells us his company, where he served, where he was born, his age, uh, physical description of him. Now he has gray eyes instead of hazel eyes, brown hair. He's a farmer still. Uh, Slide 17. Eight. Here we see information about his marriage. His wife had to prove he was she was married to him, so we find out her maiden name and exactly when and where they got married. Slide seventy nine. She actually says that the reason that said Andrew Park uh Moved was that he obtained from the government a bounty land warrant and up to the date of his death received a pension from the federal government for being a Mexican War soldier. Slide 80. Here we find, oh, I love this, Amanda R. Park, or Judkins, was actually born the 27th day of June, 1832, in Wilmington, Ohio, which is great because Wilmington, Ohio, doesn't have birth records for 1832. Slide 81. I Then my next move after finding out that he had a bounty land warrant was to fi- try to figure out how I could get that bounty land warrant. So I went to the National Archives catalog on www.archives.gov under Research Our Records. And I searched for bounty land warrants, and lo and behold, I found several things. We have a register of applications for bounty land warrants. The um, catalog description tells me the dates. It tells me who holds it. It tells me if if it's paper or what kind. It tells me it's indexed. And it tells me an inventory number and where I can get those records. Slide 82 is not microfilmed. It's the warrants that were actually issued. Again, it tells me where I can find them. Uh, It's arranged by number of acres, and they're under by number of warrant. I don't have the number. They couldn't remember it. 
in order to use these or to find them, I'm going to have to take a trip to D.C. or beg one of my friends down there to look it up for me. Slide 83. So let's look at another example that has a lot of migration information in the pension file. I tried to find Charles Rockwell, who was a homesteader in Michigan after the Civil War. And M25, which is a National Archives microfilm of Bureau of Land Management Correspondence, it's available still in Pittsfield at the Pittsfield Athenaeum. It's not indexed. The last three rolls of this microfilm collection is just correspondence of Civil War soldiers and their widows who filed for homesteads due to service. Uh, it can help you find Civil War ancestors' immigration uh, migration records. Slide 84, <clears throat> here's one of the letters. Charles Rockwell, <clears throat> Ionia, Michigan, gives us the land right under, you see right about in the middle of the page, homestead entry number 6999. That's the information you need if you're going to order the record from Washington. Turns out, when I started looking for Charles Rockwell in Michigan, that there were several of them, not just one. Slide 85. So here we have a pension card from a Charles Rockwell, a Civil War pension card. Marriage to Mary A. is his widow. He fought from the New York Engineers. Got his pension in 1882, and he's from Michigan. So in 1882, he's living in Michigan. His wife filed in 1890, and she's also in Michigan. File 80, uh, slide 86. The National Archives holds military gravestone, appli gravestone applications. These records are on film at NARA. I don't know if at the present time they're online. But here we have a Charles Rockwell who was buried in Ravenna, Michigan. Tells us he was from the New York Engineers, so we know it's the same guy as the previous slide. Slide 87, I found them on the census in 1870, <clears throat> and we see that he and his wife and all his kids were born in New York. Slide 88, so I went to the New York State Archives, and I looked at the New York State Census for 1860, and I find Charles Rockwell in Onondaga County, along with his wife and their children, and his in-laws, his Father-in-law and mother-in-law, Ebenezer and Anna Katz, are also living in the same household, and they're from Maine. Slide 89. I also looked at the agricultural census for Onondaga County, this town of Camillus, and the bottom one there is C. Rockwell. He only owned 40 acres. So if you look above him, you see that everybody else is owning a lot more land than he does. So he's a small farmer. But this, the, the agricultural censuses are available 1850, 60, and 70. They give you a lot of information about the kinds of things people farmed. Uh, this even tells you if they had honeybees, uh, how much butter, uh, how many cows and horses and pigs, how much corn they grew, how much wheat. Slide 90. I ordered this pension file for this Charles Rockwell, and in it there's a bunch, a whole bunch of affidavits from people who, guess what, came from Omondaga, New York, to Michigan. So this Charles Rockwell did not travel alone. So here we have Walter Averill's uh, affidavit, and he's saying that he was born in the state of New York, and he first knew Charles Rockwell in that state when Charles worked for my father. And he always understood that he was married to Mary Katz. Slide 91 is a Mary Ryan testifying to the fact that she knew Charles and Mary were married, but she starts out that she has been acquainted with Mary A. Rockwell, the applicant, for 45 years. I lived in the township of Onondaga, Onondaga County, New York. So here we have another person who came from Onondaga to Michigan. Slide 92 is Mary's affidavit concerning her wedding 
So we actually get information on who was there. Uh, She says her mother, her father, her sister, Emily, were all there, along with several cousins. It gives you information on when and where that all happened, all from a pension file. Slide 93 is a William Averill's affidavit defending Mary's need for a pension. This is a really great one. But he also has a lot of information about Charles. Uh, How many of us know exactly what day we met somebody? He's saying December 5th, 1839 is when he met Charles Rockwell. Slide 94, we go to GLO Records. We actually find the information on the homestead. Slide 95 is the patent record in the homestead file. Slide 96 isn't very legible. I'm sorry about that. It tells us about the second uh, homestead. Slide 97 gives us information. Here's you've got your legal description of the records. Slide 98 is from the War Department. Here's where we get the supporting information about his Civil War service to get him the free homestead, the free second 60 acres. 99, again, tells us where he enlisted, where he went in, where he got out. Slide 100 tells us where he was discharged. But if you look down about a little over halfway under, said Charles Rockwell was born in Fairfield County, Connecticut. So here you get a place of birth for this Charles Rockwell. So obviously he's not the guy from New York. Slide 101. Again, from the War Department, tells us all the information about when and where he mustered in. Turns out he was in two different companies, which was had some confusion. Slide 102. Here's Charles Rockwell with his parents on the 1850 census. So he didn't move to Michigan alone. He was already in Michigan before the Civil War, and he moved there with his parents. Slide 103. Is the 1910 census in Maple Grove shows this Charles and Lucretia uh, Rockwell. Slide 104. Oh, slide 103 is actually the 1880 census, and 104 is the 1910 census, right before he died. 105 is his pension card from the index. Uh, gives you his wife. It tells us that he was dead by 1911 because that's when his widow was filing for the pension. So slide 106, where else would we look for this Charles Rockwell? Again, we can check the agricultural census they may, schedules. They may give us more information about not only this Charles Jr., the homesteader, but about his father, get his pension record, and look for Connecticut records about his roots. Slide 107. Let's review this. First, we find out where the family started or where they ended up. We look at them on the census to find states of birth for both parents and children. Remember to check more than one. Find out what records are available for the state you're looking in. So go to the National Archives. You want to go to the Mormons, local historical societies, Google, search on U.S. Gen Web, genealogy.com, wherever you can. Look at military and pension files, land records, uh, both at the federal and local level. Read local histories. Look for family histories. And again, I can't say I love maps. Look at atlases, maps, gazetteers. This can help you visualize what was involved in this move. Natural geographic features as well as populations. And don't forget that cluster and collateral research. Very important. Slide 109, 8. So it is possible to discover not only a general route, but why they took certain routes when they traveled and can give us clues to our ancestral relationships. Remember, you're going to look at census, military, and land, but use the local and published records as well. Slide 109. Do we have any questions? Questions? 
Hi, Jean. Yes, we do have some questions. Right. The first... First question is, in the BLM website search results, some results list two names, one preceded by a P and the other by a W. What do the initials P and W mean? That's an excellent question. I hadn't noticed that. I'm trying to find that if you are wondering why you hear papers moving so that I can see it. I may need to go to the BLM website. I'm sure if I did that it would have information for me on what those abbreviations stand for. It could be patent and warrant. Okay, thank you, Jean. The second question is, remind us what the difference is again between having a patent and having a warrant. Patent is the legal ownership of the land. Once you've got the patent, you've got the ownership. The warrant is what homesteaders had, I believe, that gave them rights to settle that property and improve it. But don't quote me on that. <laughs> I'm not an expert on land patents. Okay, thank you. The next question, if you know an ancestor has owned property for over 30 years and you did not see an address on a census, how can you get a patent or warranty? Go Regarding the town or mentioned. county, depending on what state you're looking in, patent, it, they're saying it's a homesteaded or a purchased land from the federal government. It says, that's it just, what you first have to determine. Did they actually buy the land? Was it public land that they purchased from the government? Or was it by deed from the local government? And you can do that by searching the BLM site. If they don't come up, then the odds are that they either got it by a land grant or they purchased the land from a local agency. Okay, thank you. Next question. How do we email you for, for the article using pre-1850 census um, records? Well, that's an easy one. <laughs> you send me an email at jean, J-E-A-N dot N-U-D-D at N-A-R-A dot G-O-V. That's jeannud at nara dot gov. Next question. Can all this information be used to research for Puerto Rico and other Commonwealth states? Uh, some of it is. Of course, the 1850, 60, and 70 agricultural censuses are not available for Puerto Rico or other territories because they weren't territories then. But we do have later ones. Sometimes we have um, agricultural schedules for Puerto Rico I'm thinking we have some for 18, 1930 or 1940, whereas we don't have them for the continental United States for that era. Go to our website. Go use our archives catalog, and it will tell you. you www.archives.gov. at nara.gov. Thank you again, Jean. If she did not get to your question, please send an email to inquire at nara.gov. We will now have a short intermission. Our next presentation will begin at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Thank you.
Good morning, Insurance number seven, access to archival databases, AAD. Looking down from above to look it up. And our speaker is John Leglowick. John will highlight the wide range of records and access tools that it can assist researchers in finding their roots. He will highlight the National Archives access to archival databases, which provides item level records to researchers on a variety of subject areas. Mr. DeGloick is an archive specialist with the Electronic Records Division in College Park, Maryland. I now invite to the stage John LeGloick. Thank you, Andrea, for that kind introduction. And good morning and welcome to all of you out there for session seven on day two of the 2015 Virtual Genealogical Fair, looking down from above to look it up. I'm very happy to be here this morning to tell everyone out there about the wide variety of genealogical resources uh, available from the Electronic Records Division of the National Archives. I hope that you all had a chance to download the handouts for this presentation specifically uh, handout six and seven, which will allow you to follow along when I get to the live demonstrations of accessing records in AAD and downloading records from the National Archives catalog later in the presentation. It's interesting that this session is following one that was titled uh, Finding Ancestral Migration Routes. For one, when one thinks of ancestors, one thinks of faded old letters, elegant handwriting, and other ephemera from days long past. On the opposite end of the spectrum are those records that have never existed on paper, the born digital records of the federal government that we will discuss in this presentation. They are no less important to finding the breadcrumbs of a family's history than the stack of letters bound with ribbon or the old photographs found in the corner of the family homestead's attic. The records maintained by the Electronic Records Division are primarily raw statistical data but there is an advantage as these are the records of the future that you can access now. In most cases, electronic records are transferred to the National Archives because of their risk of technological obsolescence. If the raw data is relatively clean, the records can be processed and made available within a short time period from their creation. For example, within just a few years of the end of the Vietnam War, the National Archives had accessioned many of the operational and casualty records of that conflict. The Electronic Records Division has records in its custody that are just a few years old, which benefits those researchers working on contemporary research topics. Now, of course, there are researchers out there who don't get electronic records and raw data. It's okay, I can say that. I used to be one of those people. An example of the raw data held by the National Archives is those census forms that you filled out in 2010 during the last decennial census. All of those bubbles you filled in and even some of the marginalia you may have opted to write on your form was captured by census and preserved by the archives so that future generations can see where you stood in the 2010 census. As an archivist for more than 20 years, I've only been working with electronic records for the past eight and I wasn't sure how this was all gonna go when I started. We often get inquiries from researchers who have come to us from the paper side of the house, and we explain the intricacies of electronic records and raw data. Their eyes get very wide, and they'll admit they've made a serious mistake, and they really don't want what we have. But basically, the, National Ar uh, the electronic records at the National Archives ranges from statistical data to email, PDF documents, agency newsletter, interior department geospatial maps. These are records that are all created in a machine readable or computer format that require a computer for access. Obviously this means that most of our holdings date from World War II when federal agencies began using computers in carrying out government functions. It's my hope that by the end of this presentation that you will have heard something that will help you with your search for genealogical records that you are seeking and that you will gain a better understanding of electronic records and how data can be fun and helpful. One of the primary access tools available to researchers and especially genealogists is NARA's Access to Archival Databases, or AAD. AAD contains more than 120 million individual records across 64 different series. 
AED covers subjects ranging from genealogy and personal history topics like immigration and military casualty and service records, which we will look at in greater detail later in the presentation, to government spending and international relations, to name just a couple of examples. The greatest feature of AED, and though I might be a little biased, is that it takes the raw statistical data and presents it in a user-friendly format to search and view individual records. AED is one of the most popular tools used by researchers receiving its fiscal year. A good analogy to, to describe AED is that they are the self-service gas pumps of the National Archives. A researcher can pull up to the portal and get what they are looking for with relative ease. If you are looking for one individual record, what happened to your buddy in Vietnam? What year did your grandfather enlist in the Army in World War II? What was the name of the ship that brought your ancestors to the United States? These answers can all be found in AAD. In a few moments, I will demonstrate the relative ease in searching and displaying records in AAD. More recently, Electronic Records staff have been working to make available additional records for free download from the National Archives catalog. To date, we have made available over 100 series for download through the catalog, amounting to more than 11.8 billion records. I'll let that sink in for a moment and tell you that all this will be illustrated in a moment, though I won't be downloading all 11.8 billion records. You may be interested that many of the series available on AAD have also been made available for downloading and viewing through the National Archives catalog. It is worth noting that the differences between the catalog and AAD are significant. Wherein AAD presents the raw data in a user-friendly and individual-based format, the records available for download are presented in their native formats and contain the entirety of the raw data file, which need to be viewed in a software reader that can load the data in such a way that researchers can review the entire data set as opposed to the individual record. To use the gas pumps analogy again, AAD provides gasoline to run your car while the catalog is pumping out crude oil in need of refinement to make it usable. However, if your genealogy research finds you wanting to answer a question about multiple individuals, for example, how many people from Peoria, Illinois served in the United States Army during World War II, you may want to download the entire World War II Army enlistment records file, sort and manipulate the data to find that answer. Of course, you can also find that answer through some advanced searching in AAD, but there are an increasing number of researchers who like to play in the data pool all by themselves, and downloading the file allows them to do that. In a few moments, I will also de demonstrate the relative ease in downloading and viewing files from the National Archives catalog. But for the moment, let's move on to some of the specific tools to help researchers find what they are looking for. My reference colleagues and I have received many responses from individuals looking for a wide variety of records, some of which are not in the custody of the electronic division, the electronic records division, while some are. For those very high level inquiries, for example, I want everything you have on X, we often have to respond, well, yes, we have X, we also have Y, there's also R, and then this other unit probably has A and probably B too. To help researchers to refine their topic, the Electronic Records Division makes available on the National Archives website a series of reference reports on a wide range of topics, as can be seen here on this list. You can also see the URL for the reference reports page at the top of the slide. And a list of the reference reports is also available as one of the handouts for this presentation. Now you may ask why I'm showing you a list of reference reports that don't necessarily have a lot to do with genealogy. But the genealogist who is looking at the big picture may find something worthwhile in our census records along with other statistical data in some of the other records that are described in these reference reports. I will point out here that while we have census records available, the ones that many are interested in, the records of the decennial census with people's names and other information, remain closed until 72 years after the census is completed. So of all you folks camping outside for the 1950 census, you only have seven more years to go. So let's take a look at the records in the custody of the Electronic Records Division, specific to genealogy regarding World War II, 
We have five series of records, all of which are available through AAD, and all but the final item on the list are available for download from the National Archives. The first item on the list, records of duty locations for Naval Intelligence Personnel, or Naval Group China as we refer to it, contains information about military intelligence personnel serving in China during World War II. The second item on the list, Army Serial Number File, or ASNF, is one of our most popular series in our holdings, including high use by NARA staff at the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis. As most of you may know, there was a fire at the NPRC in 1973, which resulted in the loss of hundreds of thousands of official creation process to ensure that our veterans could and would receive their rightful benefits. The NPRC uses AAD to verify World War II service. The ASNF contains more than 9 million records of men and women who joined the United States Army between 1938 and 1946, excluding officers. And here you can see uh, an illustration of an Army enlistment card, which uh, you will, if you make note of the name, you, we will uh, hopefully see that later. Uh, you can see, um, and these cards were what were used in the reconstruction process following the fire. Now the next item on the list details the forced internment of Japanese Americans during World War II and contains personal descriptive data about Japanese Americans evacuated from the states of Washington, Oregon, and California to 10 relocation centers operated by the War Relocation Authority in seven states, Col California, Idaho, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, and Arkansas. In the case of World War II prisoners of war data files, this series has information about US military officers and soldiers, and U US as well as some allied civilians who were prisoners of war and internees. The final series, World War II Prisoners of the Japanese, which I noted is currently only available through AAD, contains information on military personnel and some civilians who were prisoners of the Japanese during World War II. The series includes records principally derived from the larger series previously discussed and was supplemented with additional military organization and other information. So in each of these five series, you can search in AED for an individual record for someone that served in Naval Group China, enlisted in the Army, were interned, or were a prisoner of war. For the first four, you could also download the entire data file to look at the big picture and try and find multiple situations. For example, everyone from a particular town or city, or everyone interned or, or a prisoner of war at a specific camp. Please note that you can accomplish all of these in, also in AAD, though if you were trying to satisfy a larger hypothesis, downloading and manipulating the entire data file is an avenue to explore. Moving on to the next conflict of the 20th century, the Korean War, there are four series of records that contain individual information about American service members who were either killed in the service of their country or were prisoners of war. All four of these series are searchable in AAD and available for download from the National Archives catalog. The first series, Records of Repatriated Korean Conflict Prisoners of War, contains information on approximately 4,500 former prisoners of war from the Korean War. At this point in time, POWs were considered casualties of war. The record contains the records contain one record for each repa repatriated soldier, and a variety of personal information may be found in the records, including the soldier's serial number, the date of their capture and subsequent release, along with the name of the POW internment camp where the individual was held. The next series on the list is a complementary set of records to the first series and contains records for more than 4,700 US military officers and soldiers who were prisoners of war during Korea. Each record contains the POW's name, serial number, date of birth, dossier number, rank, and prisoner of war camp. The next two series both contain casualty information from the Korean War. The first, records of military personnel who died as a result of hostilities during the Korean War, or as we refer to it, KCCF, contains selective descriptive data about US military personnel 
who died in battle during the Korean War as reported on Department of Defense Form 1300, Report of Casualty, as well as by each of the four military services of the Department of Defense. Information found in the casualty records, again, includes a wide range of personal information, including the branch of the military in which the individual was serving, the POW's hometown, their year of birth, and the situation under which they became a POW, though that field is underpopulated. The second series, Records on the Korean War and Dead and Wounded Army Casualties, or TAGACOR, contains information about US Army officers and soldiers who were casualties in the Korean War. There are more than 27,000 records for those who died, and the remaining 82,000 records are non-fatal Army casualties. The records on each casualty information can contain a lot of information, but includes the pertinent information. As with the World War II resources, all of the series listed here may be searched through AAD and or downloaded from the catalog based on the needs of the researcher or the nature of their inquiry. Now let's move on to the next conflict of the 20th century, the Vietnam War. As you can see, the Electronic Records Division holds several series of records pertaining to that conflict, four of which are listed here. The first series of records contains multiple files, which are also available for download from the catalog. The Combat Area Casualties Returned Alive file, or CACRAF, may be downloaded through the catalog. This set of records contains information about US military officers and soldiers who died, were missing in action, or prisoners of war in Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War. As with KCCF, the reports were generated from information submitted on Form 1300, the Individual Report of Casualty. There's also a similar series of records titled Records of Deceased, Wounded, Ill, or Injured Army Personnel including dependents and civilian employees from the casualty information system known as TAGSIM, which contains information about US Army personnel and their dependents who died or were injured worldwide, including missing in action and prisoners of war. TAGSIM is searchable both in AED as well as available for download from the catalog. Next on the list is a series of records that is not necessarily about death, but about recognition for service and contains information about some of the awards and decorations of honor awarded to US military officers, soldiers, and sailors, along with allied foreign military personnel. The Awards and Decoration System, AWADS, is not a complete list of all awards and decorations of honor presented during the Vietnam War. And AWADS is available for searching in AAD as well as for download from the catalog. The final series on the list is a collection of records that were donated to the National Archives by a gentleman named Richard Kofeld, hence the name. In the early 1980s, in response to a demand from veterans, Mr. Kofeld began a project to identify units down to the company, battery, and troop level for US Army deaths in the Vietnam War. After about 10 years, two others joined Kofeld in the research effort. In 2001, the project expanded to include unit information from service members from the other branches of service who died in the Vietnam War. The information found in this series contains information on US military officers who died as a result of either hostile occurrence, including while missing in action or while prisoner of war, or a non-hostile occurrence in the Southeast Asia theater during Vietnam. In particular, it provides unit information for more than 96% of US Army casualties, about 74% of US Marine Corps casualties, 65% of Air Force casualties, and approximately 85% of the Navy's losses. This series is searchably available for download. Also available for, for download from the National Archives catalog, as well as for searching in AAD, are two sets of files that cover casualty information from the 1950s through military operations in the early 2000s. The Defense Casualty Analysis System Extract Files are subsets of the larger system and cover Korea and Vietnam, while the full files cover all casualties from around the world, including casualties that occurred during peacetime away from a specific theater of operations or during other military conflicts following the end of the Vietnam War in 1975. The next series is similar to AWADS 
and concerns awards and decorations given to naval personnel. The majority of these records are from the Vietnam era, but some of the records concern awards bestowed as a result of conflicts as late as the 1990s. If you tuned into my presentation last year, you may recall that I pulled up the awards for Senator John McCain, who received multiple honors as a result of injuries sustained in his time as a POW during Vietnam, and those are available in Ames. Now, stepping back in time in a little bit, almost as far as the migratory routes that were discussed in the preceding presentation, the Electronic Records Division also has available for searching in AAD four sets of records regarding the immigration of certain European ethnic groups to the United States. While one may not think of ship passenger lists and electronic records in the same thought, there are more than six million records in AAD that document the arrival of immigrants to the ports of Baltimore, Boston, New Orleans, New York, and Philadelphia. The passenger list records came to the National Archives from the Center for Immigration Research at the Balch Institute for Ethnic Studies, which created a database with extracted information from the original paper passenger lists. This has allowed genealogists to search for names and individuals, names of individuals and the names of the ships that carried immigrants to our shores, in addition to providing the ability to undertake statistical research on those records. These records may be searched in AED by an individual's name or a number of other variables. There is also an option to search for the ship that carried the immigrants to the United States under the manifest header data file. The immigration records are currently only available through AED. There are three other genealogical related series that I wanted to highlight here today. First is the index to the Gorgas Hospital mortuary records. The Gorgas Hospital was located in the Panama Canal Zone and contains the records of more than 26,000 individuals who died in the Canal Zone and whose remains were processed through the hospital mortuary. The ownership reporting system contains records of insider trading by individuals from the late 1970s through 2001 when the trading of stocks with the benefit of inside information from corporations was in full swing despite laws in place to pr that prohibited the practice. Records of transactions on individuals like Michael Milken and Ivan Boski who benefited from insider training deals may be found in these records. The final series on this list is the National Register of Scientific and Technical Personnel of which we will look at in greater detail in a moment. These records contain data compiled from social and natural scientists who responded to survey questionnaires sent to them by professional organizations who responded to these survey questionnaires sent to them by the professional organizations, including the American Institute of Biological Sciences, the American Genealog Geological Institute, and the American Institute of Physics, just to name a few. Okay, so now what we're gonna try and do here is see how easily we can do this. So we're gonna to go to handout number six first. So if everybody has that up, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by looking in AAD. And if you don't have AAD bookmarked, that's okay. I'm gonna show you how you get there. From the National Archives homepage, which is at www.archives.gov, when you get these series of uh, colored rectangles across the top, you go ahead and click the one on the left, which says Research Our Records. Then you'll get in the next screen under the Search Online with the, with the big computer mouse there. You can go ahead and click on Access to Archival Databases, which will bring you to the, National, the Access to Archival Databases homepage. <clears throat> now, so just before we get into this, I want to show you just a few things here. So obviously here is the main search box for AD under this green banner. You can also uh, search by a variety of categories uh, under the red banner. Uh, and then underneath here, under what's new, if uh, things that have been recently added to AAD, we'll go ahead and put those here. Uh, we have AAD highlights. So for instance, if you want to see Irving Berlin's record in AAD, you can go ahead and click directly on that. 
and it would bring you that. And then this will also show you the most popular things that people are looking for. And you can see here the World War II Army enlistment records is one of our most popular series in AAD. Uh, up here, I'll point out that um, the getting started guide is a good way that if you're not really sure how to proceed, you can download this and it will help you with the steps on uh, getting started. All right, so what we're going to do here is we are going to go in the green search box, which will search across all of the series, and we are going to search for some guy named Takei and see what comes up. All right, so we're going to get 124 records in six series, and so if you see, you can scroll down here, and you'll see that there is a Takei in the Japanese American internee data file. There's files from the ownership reporting system, electronic telegrams, which are from the State Department. Uh, there were 11 Takeis who uh, joined the Army during World War II, and then there were also from some government contract information located here. All right, so now I want to, everybody to take a look at that number 52 and keep that in the back of your mind. We're going to come back to that later. But for the moment, what we're going to do is we're going to click on the View Records radio button, and it's going to bring up all of the 52 records that uh, are available under the Japanese American internee data file. Now, if you see here, you can see that Takei is highlighted as the search term that you used for your search. And what I'm then going to do is show you a few things on here. You have the option, you can download all 52 results, and you can put, put that into an Excel spreadsheet, and then you can manipulate that data however you'd like. Um, here, you can also see that there is um, the option of downloading the layout for the files, as well as seeing the FAQs and the technical uh, information, technical documentation for these files. So now what we're going to do is we're going to increase our results to 50. And then I'm going to do is I'm going to sort under first name. And so now you can see that they've all been alphabetically sorted from A to Z. All right, and we're going to go down here, and we're going to look at this record right here for Hazato G. Takai. Okay. And then this piece of paper here on the left-hand side of the page indicates that you can view the full record. All right, so now then we'll see is that we will see that um, Hazato G. Takai was interned at the Rauer Center. He reported to the Santa Anita Assembly Center. Uh, he was living in Los Angeles, California at the time. Uh, he had never been to Japan, and he was born in 1937. So this was in when he was interned between the periods of 1942-46, so he was still a small child. And so then when we go back to here, all right. so, all right. and then you can see, and then what we find is that what we have just searched for is we have found the record for Star Trek fame, George Takei who was interned at the Rauer Center. And here is a picture of Mr. Takei at the Rauer Center uh, just a few years ago. Okay. So now for the second demonstration of AAD, we're going to go back to the AAD homepage. Right. And we're going to, rather than just going with the general search box, we're going to click over here on the Browse by Subjects. And we're going to go down here to Scientists. And it's going to bring up one series of records, which is the National Register of Scientific and Technical Personnel Files, which I uh, illustrated earlier. And 
we are going to now go up here, and you'll note that this green box now says search scientists, which means that it's only going to search just this series of records. And we're going to put in the name Baez. And we're going to search, and it's going to come up with one record. And we are going to find the record for Albert V. Baez. Uh, and we will learn that Albert V. Baez was born in 1912. And he was a, mer a member of the American Institute of Physics. He responded to the survey in March of 1954, when at that time he was a professor at the University of Redlands in Redlands, California. But what this doesn't tell us, but if you found, if you came here, you were doing something about Albert Baez, you may have already known that in 1948, while he was at Stanford University, he developed the X-ray reflection microscope, which is still used in medicine today. Now, uh, so Albert Baez, seen here in the picture here, here's a picture of the uh, X-ray reflection microscope. But now Albert Baez also had two young daughters at home, uh, Mimi, who was born in 1945, and of course Joan, who was born in 1941, both of whom went on to successful singing careers. And uh, I found uh, this quote that uh, at a, Baez was at a private dinner in 1982, and when he was asked how it was to be the father of a famous person, Baez told this following story with great delight. He's like, I was at a conference dinner, and as usual, a young man was looking carefully at my name tag. And finally, he got up the courage to ask the inevitable question about my relationship to Joan Baez. But instead, he asked, are you Albert Baez, the inventor of the X-ray microscope? Now that was a compliment. Okay. So now that we have demonstrated how easy it is to access records in AED, we're going to have a look at accessing records in the National Archives catalog. Okay, so this is handout seven, which is where we are now. Um, and are, I'm assuming we're not having any problems. People are seeing that? Okay. All right, so from now we're going to go to the National Archives catalog homepage. And again, it, unless you have it bookmarked, as I'm sure many of you do, same, way to, same pathway to get there is from the National Archives homepage. You can click on Research Our Records. Okay. And then in this same search online box, they've even gone ahead and bolded it for you. So you click on the National Archives catalog. And then you'll get this uh, search box here. Now you see on this page, there are a number of uh, things here on the, on the side which will help you search tips, how to use the catalog, about the catalog, and then there's also this option here, you know, with some additional information, which if you know more specifically what it is you're looking for, you can search on a variety of things. You can search by specific people. Uh, as well as date ranges and all of that information here. Okay, but for our purposes here, we are going to uh, go and look at a particular file, which you might have the number memorized. and you're going to click search. So that is the National Archives identifier for the records about Japanese Americans relocated during World War II. Okay. And you'll see that there are five results returned. And don't believe everything you read. When it says not available online, it's not necessarily true. Because right down here is the data file where we're headed. Okay, but we're going to click on this, and you'll see that this is the full description for the Japanese American internee data file. All right, so here's the National Archives identifier that I used to search. You can see that they are from the War Relocation Authority. 
Okay, and here's the, what the records were used for, the scope and content note, and then how the records came to the custody of the National Archives. You'll see here that it, they are available through AAD, which is where we were e earlier when we were looking up Mr. Takei's record. Uh, there are the following subjects are all represented in these series. Okay. And then uh, down here, what you'll see is this number here. So there are 109,000 records uh, in the National Archives. So if we're going to go back here and I want to go back. So you'll see 109,384, which the number in the catalog is uh, increased by a few records. And as I say, I'm going to show you where that increased number is right here. So in the catalog, okay, and then you'll see here the Japanese American internee data file, which is what we were searching in AAD. So this is the uh, landing page for the view download records. And all of the records that we've made available online through the catalog, they all come with this technical specification summary, as well as a documentation package. And So this here, this is the technical specification summary. So you'll see here, here's that 109,000 number again. Uh, it shows you that the, the data file is in ASCII. Uh, with, they are fixed length records. The records del record delimiters have been placed at the end of each of the file. This is the byte size for how large the file is. Okay. And so this is the, the process by which the file was created. So now, and then you also have the option of looking at the, I think that's this one. Here's the technical documentation. So you can see here there's 94 pages of documentation. And basically this is, we took all of the paper documentation and we've scanned it and made it available and attached it to the data file. So that therefore, as you go through this and you can see what the data means when you pull it up. Because as you'll see, um, when we get to the downloading of the Japanese American internee data file, which, click, hey look, there it is. And so all of these records, so it does, it looks a lot different from So this partial records page, and so as I said earlier, where AED presents it in a user-friendly environment, everything is is clearly. This is the field title, this is the value, this is what that value means. So now when we go back over here, you see Hazado Takai, you can just read the data file across. Here's the G, which means that was his middle initial. The relocation center, nine, 
B for Santa Anita Assembly Center, and then you can just read the data all the way across. And so you see that that's how the two representations of the data in AED, everything is explained, all of the values are clearly identified. In the raw data file, you would use the technical documentation to be able to apply the code lists and the layouts to be able to interpret what that data means. Now, I told you earlier that what um, we said that there were 52 records for Takai's, and if you see that all of these, you would see that there are, these are all of the Takai's that are available in the earlier representation in AAD. All right, so this, you can download this entire file. This is just happens to be a notepad, but what you would do is you need to put it in some sort of software. Uh, you can usually put them into Excel. You can put them into a, any kind of viewer editor. Uh, the National Archives uses a program called vEdit where you can uh, just put the data files in, it will, and then it will represent itself in the native format that it needs. All right. Now, the next demonstration will be somewhat trickier. All right. So here's what we just did with through, you know, this is the, uh, here's all the Takai's highlighted. All right, so now we're gonna go back to the search page and we are going to search for Army serial number. So we put Army serial number in the search box here. All right. And you're going to get World War II Army enlistment records as available. All right. And again, it's going to say one file unit is described in the catalog. All right. And I'm going to point out that there's 11,000 records. Uh, results returned, all right? So then you get to this uh, Army electronic Army serial number merged file. Okay, here's the the landing page for the uh, viewing of the technical specification summary, as well as the documentation and the code lists which are available here. And then downloading. And you note that this says compressed electronic. Uh, so this file has been zipped due to its size. Um, so here's uh, the technical specification summary as well as the technical documentation. All right, here's the code lists. And then here's what happens is so you, it, the data file gets opened by WinZip or whatever uh, compression program that you have on your computer. All right, and then you would extract that data file out of WinZip to view the data file and search the information you are interested. So now what I had hoped to do, but the data file was just too large and I couldn't get it to, to load on this computer, but you can see here is that I've highlighted, and I apologize if it's sort of hard to read, but this is uh, the data line for Legrand Goodsell, whose enlistment card we were looking at earlier in the presentation. So the, again, here's the raw data manifestation of that enlistment card. So the data that was pulled off that punch card and created in the electronic army serial number file is available here. So you could go and you could download this entire file, sort it, you could look at um, on any kind of the variables along here that would satisfy your inquiry or hypothesis. So I hope you have enjoyed this high-level examination of the electronic records, genealogical resources available at the National Archives. Uh, I understand that many of you are just on the hunt for Uncle Joe, Great Grandma Edna, or some other hazy, mysterious family member. Uh, I hope in this presentation you might begin to wonder what was lying in the, who was lying in the next birth over. 
Or did that guy across the street go to war with Grandpa Fred? Through the wonders of data, so many more answers can be found than the one you may be looking for. Look down. It's all right there for you to discover. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, John. We have six questions. The first one, does the AAD have information on enlisted people that were not stationed in Korea during the conflict? Does it have enlistment information about Korea? Have information on enlisted soldiers that were not stationed in Korea. Uh, the AAD does not have enlistment information for any other conflict other than for World War II. The information in AAD regarding Korea and, casual, and Vietnam are primarily casualty information. Okay, thank you. Next question. Can I get information on my dad's service in Vietnam without having him sign off on it? That time is still tough for him to talk about. Uh, with the veteran still living, they would need to approve the release of the OMPF. Um, but if her father was, uh, well, obviously he's still living, but if, if the individual has, is deceased, the record could be searched in AAD, and you could also get, as the next of kin, you could get their OMPF without, obviously, their approval. Thank you. Next question. I just used AAD to search World War II Army enlistment records and found my grandfather, exclamation point. The record lists a card number, box number, and film reel number. What information would be found on the film? Oh, uh, we don't like this question. <laughs> um, We've been talking about for some time about having that information uh, pulled off because it refers to something that uh, the box reel film number, it's when the enlistment cards were microfilmed, but since the data was then migrated into this contemporary digital format, the microfilm is, it doesn't match up anymore as far as it, and being available. It's, uh, I'm just gonna see if I still have that open. John's searching. Um, um, John's still searching. Yes, I'm just, I was gonna pull up the enlistment record But yeah, it's, the problem is, is the box and the microfilm doesn't match up with this contemporary digital format. So we, we try not to. Okay. We get, but we get this question a lot, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. We'll go on to the next sure. question. After we find a record, is there an easy way to find the citation for that record in your preferred format? After, um, and then after we find the record, is there a permanent link or URL to that record that is intended to not change over time? And if so, where do we find it? Uh, there is, I know, there is citation information on the National Archives website somewhere on citing NARA's records. Um, most of the links uh, for AED and catalog downloading and things like that, you can make a static link out of something uh, and just say, you know, that it was downloaded on this particular date and include that in your format. Okay, thank you. Next question. Maybe I missed something, but how do you determine what the National Archives identifier is so that you can go get the raw data from the catalog? Uh, I just used the National Archives identifier because it was easier to search on that particular identifier. But you can search by any variety of keywords in the general search box in the National Archives catalog. So, you know, I could have just as easy put in Japanese American internees and it would have come up, but just because I wanted to specifically go right to that particular data file is why I just plugged in the exact National Archives identifier. But the when you search for something in the catalog, that National Archives identifier will be the first thing that will come up under the title of the series. Thank you, John. Next question. 
I noticed that one of the original slides referenced IRS. Does NARA archive from all agencies, and is there a time limit on release from other agencies? Uh, we do have some IRS data, though not uh, individual tax returns, which is a question we get a lot. You know, it's a, we'll get a question. I worked for so and so between 1972 and 1975, and I need my tax returns, and they were destroyed in fire in 1983. Well, I'm sorry that they were destroyed in fire, but the tax returns themselves are not considered permanent records, and they are not maintained by the National Archives. You can contact the IRS, and they will be able to verify that you paid your taxes, but those tax returns are lost. Okay, thank you. Two more questions. Mm -hmm. Is proof of age doc documentation is proof of age documentation available when enlisting? Again, a fine question and one that we get a lot is, you know, that somebody will say, oh, my grandpa, I know my grandfather was only 16 when he, you know, enlisted in World War II. And the information that we have is only as good as the information that was provided to the people taking the information. So if you walked up to an enlistment table and said, yes, I'm 18, and they didn't check that, and if you were only 16 at the time, which a lot of young men did in World War II, uh, they lied about their age. And you know, so it is not, um, you know, if somebody said, well, I'm 18, I was born in 19, you know, 22 or whatever, so therefore it would be, you know, there isn't any way of verifying that if the person lied about it when they told us. All right, so I think that was the last question. Uh, thank you again very much, and here's my contact information. If you need anything from electronic records, uh, you can feel free to email me directly, or there is our general email address for the electronic records division. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, John. If John did not get to your question, please submit an email to inquire at nara.gov. We will now have a short intermission. Our next session will begin on the hour.
If you are just joining us, my name is Andrea Bassing Matney, and I work in the National Archives Research Customer Support Division. Welcome to lecture number eight, Finding Your World War I Veteran at the National Archives at St. Louis. Our speaker is Teresa Fitzgerald. This presentation highlights the records and resources at the National Archives at St. Louis utilized to locate military service information concerning World War I veterans. Ms. Fitzgerald will explain how to access these records for both on-site and off-site researchers. Ms. Fitzgerald is Chief of the Reference Branch for the National Archives at St. Louis. I am now turning the broadcast over to Teresa Fitzgerald. Good afternoon. I am Teresa Fitzgerald, as Andrea said, and I will be speaking about World War I records and finding them at the National Archives at St. Louis. Um, before going into sp specific information concerning World War I veterans, I'm going to do a little housekeeping because our records can be confusing. The National Archives at St. Louis, National Personnel Records Center, um, we do share one building, however, we do have two different business lines. The National Personnel Records Center maintains physical custody of records that are still under the legal, legal custody of the Creating Service Branch or Agency. Information in these records is still protected by the Privacy Act and is generally only open to the veteran, the next of kin, or third party groups that were given authority to access these records. The National Archives at St. Louis, which is what I will mainly be speaking on today, maintains records that are in the legal custody of the National Archives. These records are open to the public, to anyone, and they are um, only, the only exception for information, um, re releasable information, is that, that falls under the Freedom of Information Act. So military personnel records at the National Archives at St. Louis, um, the military personnel records, official military personnel files, are open to the public if the veteran was discharged 62 years from today's date or prior. If they were separated from service 62 years from today's date, it is a permanent record in the National Archives and Records Administration and is access accessible to the public. Currently, the date is 1953, so any record of a veteran that was separated from service on today's date in 1953 or prior is open to the public. If the veteran was separated after today's date in 1953, the record is considered an unaccessioned federal record and is only open to the next of kin. Those records fall under the purview of the National Personnel Records Center. Military personnel records are generally, for our purposes, broken up into three categories, especially for this presentation. We have the official military personnel files, which is our largest record group in this building. Records of persons of exceptional prominence, those are presidents, uh, cultural figures, decorated heroes. And then auxiliary records are really where we're going to find a lot of the World War I information that might have been lost in the fire, which I will get to in a little bit. So an official military personnel file contains information, oh, sorry, I went a little too fast. The official military personnel file contains everything from the veteran's date of enlistment to their date of discharge. Uh, the most important document in this record is the DD-214, but it also contains information concerning their performance, training, emergency data, insurance information. Uh, sometimes you'll find letters and photographs, certificates of marriage, and um, birth certificates if they had children. Detailed information concerning the veteran's participation in particular battles is not contained in the record. Those can be found mostly in morning reports, and I'll get to that in a little bit. The official military personnel files that we have in our building um, cover every branch of service, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. 
We have enlisted end officer records. Um, that end date, 1953, has a little star next to it because it does fall under the 62-year rule. I'm using 1953 currently because that is the current archival date. Um, our record, our oldest records are Navy and Marine Corps. 18, they begin in 1885 and 1895. Uh, you notice Air Force doesn't start until 1947. It, that's due to the fact that the Air Force wasn't begun until 1947. So Army Air Corps and Army Air Force will fall under that Army uh, service. We did have a fire in 1973 that destroyed the majority of the Army and Air Force records from 1912 to 1963. Um, they, it destroyed about 17 million records. And that damage occurred from both fire and water. Now, due to this 1973 fire, you'll notice that the Army uh, World War I records were deeply affected by this. Uh, so we're going to mostly cover uh, Army auxiliary information that will help you find your World War I veteran in the event that the OMPF was lost. Uh, Coast Guard, Navy, and Marine Corps don't have a whole lot to worry about. Their World War I period records are intact and were not affected by the fire. Here's an example of a burned record that was caught up in the fire. So due to this fire, auxiliary records are going to become your best friend finding your World War I veteran. These next few slides are a list of all of the auxiliary records that you have access to if you would like to reconstruct some information concerning your veteran. Uh, it's, I'm sure it's very small to read. You might want to print off copies of this information from the Genealogy Fair website uh, in order to view them a little better. We have quite a few. So one of the um, more popular and um, more complete record groups that we have to assist with World War I records are the World War I burial case files. The official name is Correspondence Reports, Telegrams, Applications, and Other Papers Relating to Burials of Service Personnel, Cemeterial Files, or 293 Files. We generally just call them World War I burial case files. They also have a National Archives identifier that you see there, and you can use that to look them up. So these are Record Group 92, records of the Quartermaster General's Office. Uh, this is information relating to burials of members of the military and veterans. Uh, it also covers Red Cross workers, and I have also come across some civilian uh, casualties in this record group. These records are arranged alphabetically, so you merely need the name in order to locate a record. However, other helpful information is the date of death and possibly where they were buried. This information contains reburial information. So if a veteran was disinterred and reinterred either in a national cemetery in Europe or um, other areas, or if they were reburied in the United States. It may also contain the cir circumstances of death. Often uh, witnesses would provide statements into the matter of how the veteran um, may have died. Uh, grave markers and identification disks are, may also be held in these records. Uh, they were placed on the temporary cross above the grave and then removed when the body was reinterred into its permanent location. Correspondence uh, to and from the family notifying of the veteran's death or to and from uh, the, the army may be found in, or actually these cover all branches of service, so um, whatever branch of service may be affected, uh, you may find correspondence concerning that in these records. Other interesting documents, uh, this particular document is a receipt for flowers that were purchased for the funeral. You may also find receipts for the casket or any other um, item that may have been used in the service. 
This record group is also very rich with Gold Star Mother information. Um, mothers or widows would have taken the journey over to Europe to um, see the place where their family member was interred. Uh, this trip was generally taken between 1930 and 1933. All expenses were paid by the government, and more than 6,600 women actually took this journey. Uh, women were asked to uh, submit their photographs for identification. You may also find correspondence concerning whether or not they would like to take the trip. Um, and some also refused to take the trip due to poor health. Uh, these women were generally asked several times uh, whether or not they were well enough at a later date. These documents on the left is the itinerary for a woman's um, trip to Europe. And on the right is a notice that this particular woman's husband was in ill health and she needed to return home. The deceased veterans claim files um, are also very um, popular group. They do contain World War I veterans. They are also called compensation files or XC files. That's dead claim files. They are part of record group 15, records of the Department of Veterans Affairs. So a little history. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the pension files located in our Washington, D.C. office. Um, a lot of Civil War pension files there. Um, our particular records actually were created after the Bureau of Pensions uh, transferred this responsibility to the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, the cases that we have were generally opened between 1917 and 1945. Now that is not the date span of the records that we have. Our records actually go back to the Civil War. That is just when these uh, cases would have been opened to the public. They are currently in NARA custody. The uh, span that we currently have at our facility is if a record was transferred, and people might not know what that is, a record is transferred um, when the claim cannot, no longer benefit anyone. So generally these records were open and transferred in 1952 and 1955. They cover the Civil War, the Indian Wars, the Spanish-American War, Philippine Insurrection, and the China Relief Expedition. They are organized numerically based on a case number. Um, we have from number 2 to number 3,990,713. Only a percentage of files come from the World War II era, we don't have those yet, really. Um, some of them fall into that a little bit. I'll look at my notes. Um, but the the percentage that's World War One to 1940, um, we only have a small percentage of those. But no World War II. I, I heard that um, someone had asked about pension files from World War II in a previous presentation, and uh, we don't have those yet. So in our first box, our first case is the first casualty from World War I. Uh, this is um, deceased claim file number two, and he received a gunshot wound in the chest in the line of duty. These claim files contain a wealth of information, the full name of the individual. You can find the birth date, um, parents and family information, any of the beneficiaries' information, their dates of enlistment, periods of service, units, residence, and date of death. If the veteran survives the service, you may be able to find much more. Uh, you would have actual discharge papers. If the veteran did not survive, he would not receive a discharge paper. He would receive a death certificate. You would find later medical records from claims he may have made after the war, any changes of address, uh, information concerning wills and death certificates, and funeral receipts. 
You can also find family information, uh, marriage certificates, birth certificates, and death certificates concerning family, correspondence back and forth between family members, and affidavits. If the veteran was serving from um, and, and his family and he came from another country, you may find insurance applications that were filed from family members from the country of origin. Uh, this would include foreign documents as they would have completed documents in their own language and photographs of the family. Another World War I uh, record group that we utilize are Return of the Nurse Corps. If you know your relative was a nurse, um, this might be a good collection to consult. This covers the date span of 1917 to 1921. It was created by the War Department and covers the Army Nurse Corps from the U.S. and Overseas Service. This information contains their rank, any transfers, if they got sick, if they died, promotions, discharges, and any leave they may have taken. This is basically a, a roster of nurses, um, and complete rosters can be contained in this collection. Uh, however, you will need to know where your relative served at a nurse in order to use this record group to find your relative. Another popular group that is utilized to recreate service are pay cards and vouchers. They were created by the General Accounting Office and kept track of compensation and deductions. We use this group highly to reconstruct service in order to prove uh, the veteran service for benefits. Army World War I officer and nurse pay cards and final pay vouchers cover the time span between 1907 and 1920, 1917 and 1921. They do have a National Archives identifier for the cards and for the vouchers. It is different, so if you're looking for one of the other, uh, you might want to note those two different numbers. This is what they look like. This is actually a, a single pay card and single voucher. It can include um, definitely their pay informa information. It will know whether or not they had foreign service. It will note that um, there are also their deductions from food and quarters. Uh, it will note the date they were paid, the quartermaster that paid them, if that might be important for you. A veteran won't always have a pay card or pay voucher. If the veteran died in service, as you see in this example, uh, he will not receive a final pay card or final pay voucher because he died. He may also not receive one because he was court-martialed and dishonorably discharged from the service. Enlisted men final pay vouchers are different from officer final pay vouchers. Uh, they do have a different identifier and they come in two forms, single and multiple pay vouchers. The single pay voucher will contain the rank, the unit, the enlistment date and place and the character of discharge for one veteran. Multiple pay vouchers will contain multiple veterans and will list the serial number, the rank of the veteran, enlistment date and place, uh, allotments, and locations of discharge. And here's an example of the multiple pay vouchers. Payments to enlistment men are for U.S. Army enlisted personnel. Uh, they are only for enlisted men despite the fact that that form currently says payments to officers of the U.S. Army. Um, so don't, don't be confused. They only have the pay dates and amounts, but they do include the rank and unit and payment details. Uh, some remarks um, might include deductions 
and uh, the soldier's specific duty. World War I award cards are um, mostly for World War I. I have randomly found some Civil War uh, award cards. They do mostly cover the Army, um, but some other branches are found in there. Um, I've seen Marine Corps record or Marine Corps award cards, as well as civilian award cards. Um, they were created for men um, to honor their service accomplishments and acts of heroism or injury. And acts of heroism um, actually pertains to some of the civilian cards that I have seen. These include the name of the veteran, their service number, ranks, uh, the general order number, which you can use to find the actual general order that lists what they did, uh, the date and issuing organization, the type of award, and sometimes the description of the event. The World War I National Guard papers uh, consists of correspondence between the State Adjutant General's Office, the Adjutant General of the United States Army, and the individual state units of the National Guard concerning the federalization of the National Guard uh, slightly prior to World War I and during World War I. Um, these records are not actually located by name. They are um, organized by subject. So letters of transmittal, oaths and contracts, physical qualifications, some um, prior service of the veterans, and regimental papers and documents. Uh, this group contains all of the names of uh, the National Guard soldiers affiliated with service. And um, you would use this if you were maybe doing more research on National Guard federalization. Uh, you can find your veteran if you know the state that they came from and the state National Guard that they served with. Uh, detailed information concerning what the different subjects contain. Uh, the letters of transmittal uh, concern mustering and, mu and mustering out. OSIN contracts are the oaths that the National Guardsmen would have signed. Physical qualifications concern medical information of the veterans. Prior service files will list any prior service they may have had. So if you find that your relative or the veteran you are researching had prior service, you can use this information to then go and find um, their prior service record. The Russian Railway Corps was a State Department um, group formed, um, well, the State Department formed the semi-military organization of railway engineers and technicians in September of 1917 at the request of the Russian government to assist with operating the Trans-Siberian, Chinese Eastern, and Usuri railways and instruct the Russian railway men in the American methods of railway operation. The Corps originally did not have any connection with the military. However, they did have simulated military ranks and were uniformed similar to Army officers. Uh, due to this and due to where they were serving in Russia during this time, on March 30, 1971, the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia determined that service with the Russian Railway Corps was creditable for military service. Uh, information contained in these records um, are for each member, and these are arranged alphabetically by the name of the soldier. Um, they contain work history, behavior, pain allotment information, uh, medical conditions, commissions received, promotions, and correspondence. Here's an example of a Russian Railway Corps card that would be located in the record. This contains information about their application, vaccinations, uh, commissions, 
um, whether or not they received a uniform, and general information. The Selective Service Records, uh, the NARA at, NARA at St. Louis maintains World War II service through the Vietnam era. era. So any uh, person that was born prior to 1960, we would have their Selective Service information. The main World War I Selective Service draft information is contained at the National Archives in Atlanta. These would have been the cards and classification ledgers completed directly prior to World War I. You may find the cards on Ancestry, however, image quality may be difficult, so if you wish to write directly to the National Archives in Atlanta, I have provided the address on this slide. The draft information that we currently have at the National Archives at St. Louis concerns the old man's draft. Uh, these men have dates of birth between April 28, 18, 1877 to February 16, 1897. These men were not liable for military service. They were merely to note occupational strength. This card is the card of Albert Einstein. Information contained on these cards, the name, the order number and serial number, mailing addresses, date of birth, place of birth, the employer's name, and physical characteristics that might aid in identification of the gentleman. The National Archives at St. Louis also holds the general courts martial records. Uh, Jackie Robinson was courts martialed in World War II, but we do have general courts martials from 1917 to 1976. These are part of Record Group 153, records of the Office of the Judge Advocate General. They do come the earlier period that covers World War I from 1917 to 1938 does have a National Archives identifier. These are Army General Courts Martial and Special Courts Martial records resulting in a bad conduct discharge. Special Court Martial records that did not result in a bad conduct discharge were destroyed and no longer exist. These are arranged numerically by the case number and will contain charges and specifications, pleas, proceedings, sentences, exhibit material, and photographs. So what information is needed to locate a military personnel file? For an official military personnel file, you can complete a standard Form 180 that will specifically ask for all of this information. The most important information is the veteran's name as used in service, their service number if you have it, the branch of service, date and place of, ser of birth, and dates of service. For records that were affected by the fire, which include these World War I records, information such as their place of discharge, last assigned unit, and place of entry into service may be useful in locating a record. For the other record groups that I detailed, burial case files, you will need their full name, date of birth or death, and their service number, and um, the place of burial is also helpful in locating these records. The Veterans Administration claim files, or the deceased veterans claim files, requires the full name, the claim file number, the place of residence or enlistment, and the date of birth and or death. Claim file numbers can be found on the Veterans Administration um, the, um, index cards. Sorry, um, that this card on this screen is one of those cards, and there's a little C up in the top right corner with a number next to it. There is also an X on the card. That number may be found there as well. That is what we use to locate these records. If you do not have that number, which many people do not, you may write in to us with as much information as possible, and we can locate that number for you. 
The return of the nurse corps records require the unit and location in which they served and the full name of the nurse you are seeking. The pay cards, vouchers, and payments to enlisted men is the full name, the rank, and their unit information. World War I award cards require the full name, if you know the service number, the unit, and what cards they may have received. The National Guard papers are arranged by state, so you would need to know the state in which your veteran served. The Russian Railway Corps records are arranged alphabetically by the surname of the veteran, and we would require the complete name of the veteran as used in service. Selective service records have a specific request form that you can find on our website. Specific information such as the complete name, the date of birth, and the home address at time of registration is required. These records are arranged and located by state, city, and local board, so that home address is actually important in order to locate a record. The general court martial records require the name, service number if you know it, the unit if you know it, and the approximate date and place of the trial. Uh, these records are arranged by case number and are located using a card index that is arranged alphabetically by the surname of the veteran on trial. Unfortunately, they are not arranged by uh, the type of crime committed, so when we don't have um, groups of records um, by specifically by the crime. So those are all of the uh, personal data series that you can use to find your World War I record. An additional source of information that may be used are the morning reports and unit rosters. These were created as part of the personnel and payroll functions by the Military Service Department. And these are the records that will be used to verify events or assignments and um, that might not be documented in the official military personnel file. The morning reports that are open to the public are morning reports um, from 1912 to 1959 for the Army. Uh, the Air Force uh, covers 1947 to 1966. The World War I morning reports are indexed by the type of unit or arm of service and then by the numerical designation. And I have an example on the next slide. Uh, the index card shows the box number that identifies the microfilm reel, so we are able to locate the morning report you are seeking. So if you notice, uh, that says machine gun company, and then um, it says 17th Infantry right next to it, so that is the machine gun company would be the type of unit or arm of service and then the 17th Infantry would be that numerical designation. Here's an example of the World War I Morning Reports Remarks page. Uh, it can be difficult to read. And the Strengths page will be the number of men that may have been transferred uh, due to illness or uh, transferred to a different unit may have died, so it's reporting how many men may have come and gone and how many they have left. An additional source, um, if your relative or the veteran you are seeking had a record that was lost in the fire are our civilian personnel records. These records are archival um, up through 1951, so any record, any person that served with the United States government in 1951 or prior is open to the public. They are in the complete custody of NARA and um, anyone may uh, request them. We also have CCC and WPA records. Uh, I know these go into the 30s, but I do have an example. These are examples of the CCC forms and WPA, and on the CCC form it does ask if you had prior military or naval service. And many of the uh, other civilian personnel records have this question as well. Um, they would have answered yes and possibly said 
what branch they served in, provided a discharge paper, and more information concerning service prior to this time, which would include World War I. So how do you request these records? Um, for the civilian personnel records, these you would need the full name of the employee, the date of birth, the employing agency, and the dates of employment, and if you know their social security number. Um, CCC or WPA, they also have specific forms that you can find on our website to request the records, but you would need their full name, date of birth, social security number if you know it, uh, their dates of service, and maybe where they were employed. So to request an official military personnel file, this is for all branches of service, um, you would complete a standard Form 180, which may be found on our website, and you can mail it to the National Personnel Records Center. The address is found on our website. It's found on the standard Form 180. It's on this slide. You could fax it to the fax number provided. Or if you don't have access to a computer or a standard Form 180, you can write us a letter, including all of the information that I um, previously said is required in order to locate a record. And this is for all branches of service. I always highly suggest, even though you know that your family member served in the Army and the record was probably affected by the fire, to request the OMPF anyway. We may have a record that survived the fire or partially survived it, or we could have a reconstructed file that may um, have been reconstructed enough to at least prove that they had service. If you would like to request any of the other auxiliary record groups that I spoke about today, you could mail a request to our PO box or fax it to the fax number on the screen, the 314-801-9187. We also have an email address that you can write to, and it's on another it's on the it's on another slide, but it's stl.archives at nara.gov, and it will be on I believe it's the third second to last slide. We do have fees for accessioned records. Um, official military personnel files come with a fee of seventy dollars for records over five pages. $25 for five pages or less, and um, the other uh, record groups are broken down there. Our Persons of Exceptional Prominence Collection, those are those records that include um, presidents and famous cultural figures. Some of those records have been digitized. Uh, that is the only record group that we have um, been able to digitize so far. But those digital formats come with a fee that range from $20 to $250. There's a list of all of the records that are in our Persons of Exceptional Prominence collection, as well as whether or not they've been digitized and how much they are located on our website. If you would like to visit our archival research room, you may do so by setting up an appointment. Um, you can call 314-801-0850 or email the email address provided. Those morning reports that I spoke of may only be viewed in our archival research room. So if that is a source that you would like to look into, you would need to visit our research room or hire a researcher. And information um, concerning how to hire a researcher may also be found on our website. But if you would like to visit personally, uh, the information on how to do so is on this slide. This is additional contact information, our specific website, uh, the military personnel records that are open to the public, military records not open to the public, um, the Persons of Exceptional Prominence website, and the Civilian Personnel Records website. Additional contact information. Uh, general inquiries or requests can be sent to that stl.archives at nara.gov website. The research room has a separate website as well, or 
email address, my apologies. You may email the persons of exceptional prominence email address if you would like to request one of those. Uh, we no longer have the public programs email address. Um, you can just email stl.archives at nara.gov if you have a question about public programs. If you would like more information concerning military personnel records or anything I spoke of today, you are welcome to email me directly. If you have questions concerning those civilian personnel records that I touched on, uh, Ms. Ashley Mattingly is the primary source of those records and her email address is listed. And that's it. Okay, thank you so much, Teresa. We have quite a few questions for you. First, okay. first one. What was the next of kin search criteria that you mentioned earlier? I would like to research my father and uncle's military. Can my, <clears throat> excuse me, can my cousins or aunts gain access to their next of kin military? For example, after 1953? The records that are open to the public um, are that 1953 date and prior. After 1953, the next of kin is considered the mother, daughter, mother, father, daughter, son, brother, or sister. If there is no other surviving next of kin, you would need to petition the branch of service in which they served in order to acquire permission to view their record. Okay, thank you. Next question. How can one learn about cause of death of a soldier buried in France in 1918? Is that part of RG92? Those are located in the World War I burial files. It will, um, it will show how they died and all of the information surrounding their burial and reinterment or disinterment and Gold Star Mother information. So that would be a very good source about how to find out the circumstances of death. Thank you. Next question, which is one we all concentrate on. How are records protected from fires nowadays? Oh gosh, well we have a, a state-of-the-art system now. Um, we have, this is, I am not on the technical side of how this happened. I'll take a stab, this is Diane. Um, all of our buildings have to, have to be raided. We have um, fire suppression systems, we have sprinklers, we have chemicals, and so it's something the National Archives is greatly focused on. So things are much better these days. Technology has moved on and enabled us to make some changes. Okay, the next question. Are copies of the letters to families regarding notification of death, of death part preserved for all soldiers who died in the war? The Western Union telegrams are often found in the burial files and the official military personnel files if that official military personnel file was not destroyed in the fire. Those copies aren't necessarily kept separately in their own record collection. They would be filed in the record of the soldier that died in service. Thank you. Next question. My great-grandmother was eligible as a Gold Star mother and is on the Ancestry database, but she did not travel as she was older. Where does one find that data? You could find that in the World War I burial file of the veteran that she was going to visit that died in service. Thank you. Did laboratory workers, for example, bacteriologists, get hired by Army Nurse Corps? My grandmother served during World War I and claimed to be a lieutenant, but the Form 1811 submitted did not yield any documents. Yes, uh, the return of the Nurse Corps records um, does include information concerning uh, workers other than nurses. Uh, there were bacteriologists, dermatologists were included, and some dental um, hygienists. Okay, thank you. Next question. Is the information about individual regiments such as the 809th is there information about individual regiments such as the 809th Pioneer Infantry? For 
uh, World War I, those would be contained on the morning reports. So you could find more information concerning the specific unit activities on the Army morning reports. Okay, thank you. Do you have any advice for narrowing down the dates of service if we do not know them? What I'm trying to do is connect the dots between the date draft registration card and his service. I have his unit, but nothing else. You could complete the standard form 180 with as much information as possible. And even if you had just an approximate timeline, if you think maybe it might have been the end of World War II to Korea, that is information that we can use to take to our resources to find out for you. Okay, thank you. Next question. Would there possibly be references to World War I civilian volunteers in St. Louis World War I record groups? To clarify my question, what I mean is volunteers with organizations, not civilians who were working with the U.S. government. Oh, that's a good question for Ms. Ashley Mattingly. Um, our civilian employment records really only concern those employed with the United States government. Uh, we do not have information concerning contractors or volunteers that may have assisted with projects in a civilian capacity. Okay, thank you. Next question. Can one obtain these files in person by visiting the NPRC in St. Louis? Yes, you are welcome to request these records and view them in our archival research room. Uh, we do require appointments prior to viewing them. So what you could do is email that email address that goes to the archival research room. They will correspond with you and provide you with the request form. And then what happens is we will locate a record and once we locate a record, we call you to establish an appointment. Okay. Next question. When you request records, in what format are they returned? Oh, uh, they are, re when you request a record and after we receive your payment, you will receive paper copies of the records. The only exception to this is if you are requesting a person's of exceptional prominence record that has been digitized. In that case, you would receive a CD or DVD. Solution digital format. Did you hear all of my question? I'm sorry, no, I'm my microphone is cutting out. Oh. Um, the second part of that question was, can you get high resolution digital format in general, I think, is the question. Currently, we are not uh, providing that unless you are requesting a photograph of, um, if, if a photograph was found in a record, uh, photographs can be found in World War I burial files, veterans claim files, some OMPFs, if you are requesting a high resolution digital image of a photo, yes, we can do that. But currently, we are not digitizing complete records. Okay, thank you. Next question. Is there a microfilm copy of the VA Master Index at the National Archives in College Park, Maryland? This might not be a question for you. I don't know. I do not believe so. Okay. But I am unsure. Okay, thank, thank you. If a soldier is on a missing monument in France, is there any further information available? Generally, if they are on a missing monument, um, they most likely died in service. There is a possibility there would be a World War I burial file for that veteran. Thank you. How can I find my great-grandfather's information? He was a bugler in World War I. The, the basic question is, can he be found in your records? You can complete a standard Form 180 with as much information as possible, and we will use our resources in order to either locate a record or um, reconstruct some of his service if it was lost in the fire. Okay, thank you. Next question. My World War I veteran died in an old soldier's home in Los Angeles. Do any records for these homes exist and who holds them? The 
Records of old soldiers' homes are located at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Okay, thank you. Are Army serial numbers assigned to an individual and used for all military service during their life or just for a given enlistment period? In other words, if enlisted twice, two serial numbers, possibly? It depends. Mm -hmm. um, the service numbers were generally used uh, beginning around 1912 to the late 1960s. Uh, prior or after the 1960s, it switched to social security numbers and the social security number would be used across all branches. Service numbers would change whether or not you became an officer, whether or not you entered a different branch of service, um, depending on how long the time span was between service, it may have changed. Okay, and finally, our last question. When do we expect the younger men's draft records for World War II to be released? Any man that was born prior to 1960 has a selective service record that is already open to the public. Okay, thank you so much, Teresa. And we'll now turn the microphone over to Andrea Bassing Matley. Thank you so much, Teresa. You did a record breaking number of questions. If Teresa did not get to your question, please submit it to our email address, inquire at nara.gov. Before we go on to a break, I have three announcements to make from the Foundation for the National Archives. These are fun announcements. First, use coupon code GEN15 for 15% 15 off of your entire purchase at myarchivesstore.org. Again, that's GEN15, G-E-N-1-5. Second, go to archivesfoundation.org slash Gen giveaway and enter to win a $200 gift card for myarchivestore.org. Last, we have a selfie contest. Thank you for the ones that have already been submitted. We love them. We are doing that through Twitter. Take a selfie of yourself participating in the fair, tag at US Nat Archives and hashtag Gen Fair 2015 for a chance to win a genealogy prize pack from the National Archives store. And we will now have a short intermission. Our next session will begin on the hour. Thank you.
We can't bring up. Welcome back, pardon me. Welcome back to the National Archives Virtual Genealogy Fair. We are now beginning lecture number nine. It is entitled Women in Wartime Civilian Government Employment. And our speaker is Kara Moore. During the First and Second World Wars, government agencies employed women to aid in the wartime efforts and to cover jobs previously filled by men. This employment created an extensive paper trail on females. The civilian official personnel folders for various departments often recorded the maiden names of married women, sometimes their parents' information, and addresses of the employee. Ms. Moore will cover the content of these record series and how they can aid in genealogical research. Ms. Moore is an archive specialist and she works at the National Archives St. Louis. I'm now turning the broadcast over to Kara Moore. Okay, can you show my slides up there? Okay, um, I'm going to cover women in wartime civilian employment. Um, I'm going to focus on three of our largest department series. All of our records are organized by agency and then year group and then alphabetically. On my first slide here, I have a picture of Lucille Atcherson, who worked for the Department of State. She was the first women, woman to be employed in U.S. Foreign Service as a diplomatic officer. She was an officer for Bern, Switzerland in the 1920s. Um, and she's got a very interesting record that I'll talk about again later. The Department of the Navy was established in 1798 to begin the building of naval ships. It's one of the largest of our record groups. It's going to be the second largest group that I'm talking about today. The Department of the Army Air Force is the largest record group that I'm going to be talking about today. It was the Department of War prior to 1939, and they began the 201 and personnel files. Um, they became a combined agency of Army Air Force, formerly Army and Air Corps separate agencies, in 1947 under the Department of Defense. The Department of State is the smallest of the three series that I'm going to talk about today. Um, they were established in 1781 as one of the first constitutional agencies set up by the Constitution. They were called the Department of Foreign Affairs until 1789. All of these departments and many others experienced a huge jump in employment following the First World War and again during the Second World War. Um, the statistics and numbers for these can be found at opm.gov. It breaks it down year by year for how many people were working for the government during those times. There were many different kind of women who were involved in wartime work, whether they were married or single, divorced, mothers both being married or divorced or widowed because of the war. Um, and then even people who were childless and really just wanted to help the war effort in the best way that they could. Um, they were a lot of different kinds of women that were represented. They were varying in marital status, age, race, economic status, um, just all across the board. There weren't a specific kind of woman who was really involved. In the top right hand corner, we have a photo of Ann Singleton. She worked for the Department of State. They have some of my favorite photographs because they're all a little bit like a glamour shot and it's pretty amazing. Um, at the bottom we have the badge for Miss Nora O'Leary. She worked for the Department of the Navy and her badge has got a little bit of information there which is always interesting to see. You can see in the background she also has a height chart with her photo so that's always very interesting to see. Each one of these agencies um, and departments have sub-agencies and different projects that they worked on. This isn't a comprehensive list of the sub-agencies for each department, but it gives you a little bit of an insight. And the Department of Navy would employ people for the Military Sea Transport Service, in Navy yards, and in Navy hospitals. The Department of the Army Air Force deployed people to work for the Army Transport Service, the labor service company. Department of State um, also employed alien employees. 
the Office of Facts and Figures, Office of War Information, Inter-American Affairs and Transportation, Texas Continental Exposition. Like I said, there are a lot more sub-agencies that work within these departments, and that's really common across all government agencies. Um, on the right-hand side, I have an image of a name change. This individual is Jacqueline Jenkins Nye, who happens to be the mother of Bill Nye the Science Guy. Um, she worked for the Department of the Navy, and as you see at the bottom there, we're notating a name change. She changes to Mrs. Edwin Darby Nye from Jacqueline Jenkins. So that's going to be common whenever somebody gets married during their employment. We're going to see that name change, and it's going to be represented both with her maiden name and with her married name. Um, with all these sub-agencies, it's important to remember that if an individual worked for the government by means of a contractor, they weren't formally employed by the government, and we will not have an OPF for those contract employees. But a lot of times we have the sub-agencies that worked if they were employed by the government. Many women served only during the wartime, but there were a significant amount who continued their employment, especially if there wasn't a man who come, came back and replaced her or if she was now the sole income for the family. Um, the Service Extension Act of 1941 allowed for an extension of service a lot further out than the trial periods that women were commonly given. Um, it was a national peril situation that allowed this act to go through. Um, soldiers returning home did segue women out of jobs and back into the home, um, as we see a lot with the culture of the 50s. But because of the Service Extension Act, a lot of women were allowed to retain their jobs and their employment lasted a little bit longer. Um, Jacqueline Jenkins Nye is one individual who was able to continue her employment because of the Service Extension Act. Um, some of the language says, we have improved your appointment to extend during present war. So it still notates that it's during the present war, but it's an extension. These records are full of different genealogical information. Um, their applications for employment list date and place of birth, emergency contact, whether it's the husband, the parent, sometimes it's the husband's family, and it's going to have contact information for them. It's going to have addresses of previous employers, their previous addresses, their parents' addresses, different references that were giving them um, referrals for the job and listing employment history their addresses are sometimes included, their parents' citizenship or if they were naturalized, previous government employment, relatives that were employed in the government. It's always helpful to see maybe if you didn't know your great aunt served, it's going to be listed in there, or your great uncle. It's a nice way to kind of discover more information about your family in different areas. It's also going to list the maiden name of the individual any alternate names that they had. Um, the mother's name is going to be on there. Sometimes the mother's maiden name is also listed. Um, with date and place of birth, sometimes there's affidavits that include proof of birth. Um, In-laws sometimes are mentioned, and siblings, depending on where their next of kin is. Their religious affiliation, their current job description and pay grade different address changes that happen throughout their employment and then after employment for benefit needs, their reason for resignation, and any leave that's taken during the time period that they're employed. Not all of these items are going to be found in every file. Some may have a mix and match, but this is a good list of what's going to be normally found. Here I have two examples of pieces out of the Department of the Navy on the left is Mammy Oatney. She lists her in case of death information, which includes that she would like a minister and that she is Protestant. On the right 
is Rose B. Moore's application. On the right hand side in the top corner of it, she lists her mother's naturalization in New Jersey in 1919. These are some examples from the Department of Army Air Force. On the left is Miss Ruth Cooper, who notes her reason for leaving the previous job was that she wanted to enter war work. So it's always interesting to see that these women are going and trying to support the war efforts in the different ways that they can. On the right hand side, you'll note that I have the social security number redacted because of the birth date being less than 100 years old. Um, this is Catherine Bocavoy. It lists her maiden name as Pomeroy, her mother's maiden name as Stuart, her in-law's name as Prince Bocavoy, and an and maiden name, and then her siblings' names, and including their married names as well. So you can see this is really rich with different genealogical information, especially with women being traditionally harder to track because they do change their names. A government OPM is going to be, or OPF, I'm sorry, is going to be a really good document to help you trace back different names and different lineages. This is some examples from the Department of State. On the left, we have Miss Lucille Atchison again. This is a note that's talking about her resigning and it notes that there may be an issue that comes up later because she resigned due to not getting a promotion and it has been rumored to accuse it being a gender bias. So she thinks she wasn't promoted because she was a woman where there are other men who were employed at the same time who have been promoted before her. Um, so little notes like that are gonna be common in these records. It's always interesting to see little pieces of correspondence that kind of happen behind the scenes. On the right is Miss Anna von, von Bukovic. This lists not only her naturalization date, but also the number that she was given. So that's really helpful for looking up when and where she came over and different information about the passenger list. You can kind of do some backwards work with that. These are some of the different forms that you're going to find in different records, applications, reference details. When there's a change in a job, if somebody switches from one title to another, whether or not it's a promotion or demotion, those are always going to be found in these records. Any change in pay, again, upwards or less. Correspondence both between the department heads and also if she wrote any kind of letter in or um, any notes that were sent to her, all of those correspondence are going to be held in her file. Specific letters of reference, rather than just a list, there's sometimes also letters that were sent in. Position changes, any certifications or awards that were obtained while on the job, trainings that were completed, and efficiency ratings. Um, those are helpful because sometimes the efficiency ratings and the trainings that are completed We'll talk about they didn't get through because there was a sick child or they had to go meet their husband. Um, a lot of times they list reasons of things that were going on in their personal lives. Um, on the right hand side, we see Majorie Fullen. She worked for the Department of the Army Air Force and she lists the reason for leaving her job, her resignation is that she has been replaced by an enlisted man who is trained as an x-ray technician. So you will see that sometimes that these women are moved out of their job to let a man take their place. This is a list of information that's going to be found sometimes. It's just not a guarantee that they're going to be in every file. Um, reason for employment, listing urgent need, current emergency, those are both referring to the war. Um, husband's family information, it's not always going to go beyond husband being listed as next of kin, but sometimes it will and it will give their um, detailed addresses, names, things like that. The husband's employment, especially if it's going to be government employment, that will be listed. Um, sometimes even outside of government employment it's listed. 
the medical leave or a relevant medical notation or injury on the job, if any of that occurs, it's going to be notated. Badges and passes that were administered, that also includes any kind of security clearance that they would have received. Pictures are pretty commonly found. It's just not a constant, um, especially if it's on a badge or something and a badge gets left in the file. Newspaper clippings about anything that was going on at the time that would have been relevant to their employment can be found. Different languages known or spoken sometimes is relevant, especially if they're hired as a translator or um, a radio person. Statements of loyalty were pretty common to be found depending on what time period of the war is going on, and sometimes fingerprints were taken. And the bottom we can see Mercedes Davalos, who works for the Department of Army Air Force, and it's not only her badge, but it also tells you when she switches from temporary to permanent. Medical information is going to be a little bit more common for state service if, they, if there was foreign, foreign service required, because then they had to go through different kinds of medical checks to make sure they were fit to leave the country. Information that's not going to be found or very rarely going to be found is any kind of complete medical history. On the right, I have Catherine Bokovoy's um, resignation page. It notes her reason for leaving as ill health. Sometimes if there's correspondence about it, it'll be more detailed, but a lot of times that's as detailed as any medical things are going to happen. Um, they're just not included unless the medical state affects the job in some way. To write in and request some of these records, we need the full name used during federal employment, any maiden name if you know it, or the name from any and all previous marriages are going to be really important for female records because they can be pulled and put with the newer names even if they got married after their service. Um, they can also be all listed under a maiden name if they were not married when they entered service. It really just runs the gamut of how these were collected. Um, date of birth, social security number sometimes is not going to be there if they served really early. Um, it's not always required, it just helps us verify that we have the right file. The name and location of the employing federal agency is really important. Like I said in the beginning, um, all of these records are organized first and foremost by agency and then by the time period that they worked and then by an alphabetical run. Um, knowing where they worked is going to help us narrow down if maybe they worked for a sub-agency underneath an umbrella agency. We can look in some smaller areas. Um, Beginning and ending dates of federal service, again, important because we have it organized by date ranges after the agency. Um, you can write into us, National Archives and Records Administration here in St. Louis. You can also send us an email about your inquiry, stl.archives at nara.gov. Um, as an alternative to paying for copies and having us send them to you. You can also request a viewing by appointment in the research room. Um, that email is stlarr.archives at nara.gov. Um, I know that was a question in the last presentation is whether or not you could come and view these records. You can view um, some of the records, anything on microfilm, we're going to print out for you first and then you'll view those printouts in office, but then that way you can just take copies of what you want rather than the whole file if the cost starts to get up there for you. Civilian records are, are a little unique in that we don't have a rolling date for what's archival. We do have an annex nearby in Valmeyer. Um, since the National Personnel Records Center maintains the official personnel 
holders of formal federal citizen employees whose employment ended after 1951, that means that it's going to be non archable and has to be treated a little bit differently. It's not completely open to the public. We do work very closely with the Valmeyer Annex to ensure that all requests are processed and completed to the best of our ability. If you're unsure of a date of employment, if it's somewhere around that time, by all means, please feel free to reach out to us and we will look at the request and help put it in the right place. Um, written request, if you know it's definitely after 1951, can be mailed or faxed to Valmeyer with the address and the fax number there. And that's the end of my presentation. So I hope this was informative for you and we are going to go to questions now. That's my contact information, um, my email and telephone number. Thank you so much, Kara. We have about six questions for you. The first one is, a cousin worked for the Social Security Administration as an economist from its establishment through the war. What kinds of federal records might be available for her? Um, what was the time period again? I'm sorry. Um, Social Security Administration as an economist from its establishment through the war. Um, no date. Okay, well, the latest that can be is the Second World War, I guess. So um, we will have those records just write in and let us know the name, their date of birth, include that information that they worked through the entirety of it and um, we'll process that request. We'll go out and pull the record if, it's, if we find it there, as long as they worked for the Social Security admin and not, weren't contracted through somebody else to do some odd and end job, then we should have a record here. We'll go and pull it, and then um, the contents of the file vary by individual depending on how long they worked there, how intricate their job was, Again, if there was any medical leave, may or may not be included, but we can definitely go and look and see if there's a file, and then one way or another, we'll let you know. We'll either send you an invoice, refer you to let you know it's available to view in the research room, or we'll send you a negative, and we'll let you know every place that we looked for it, and then you can kind of go from there. If we think it could be somewhere else, we'll definitely let you know. Okay, thank you. Next question. Will these record sets include employees who needed clearances to work building airplanes or ships or working as scientists on the Manhattan Project? We do have some records of the Manhattan Project, definitely. Those are ones that are really tricky because a lot of them were actually contracted. We have a couple different runs that include employees who worked on the Manhattan Project. They can be in the Department of Army Air Force. They can be at, in Los Alamos. They can be in a couple different areas, the Office of Scientific Information. Um, unfortunately, I can't give you a blanket yes or no because the Manhattan Project had a lot of contractors. We'll gladly search for it and see if we have something here. I just can't give you a definitive yes or no without searching. Okay, thank you. Next question. Would older civilian men who worked in naval yards just after World War I also be in these records or would they be found in a different way? No, if they worked in the naval yard in a civilian capacity, we all have their records. Um, those, Navy is one of those areas where I definitely want location because outside, if we don't have a personnel file for it, sometimes we have what's called an SRC, which David Harden and Daria Levinsky talked about yesterday, their service record cards. Those are oftentimes organized by location as well. So if you can give me a list of the different places that he worked, I can look in those areas as well as in the personnel files, but yeah, men are included in these. Um, again, make sure it's a civilian capacity, otherwise they'll have a military record rather than a civilian record. Okay, thank you. Next question. My great-grandmother worked at the Robbins Air Force Base in Georgia. I also had other family members that were employed there. How can I find out if they were actually government employees? By requesting it, that's about it. We don't have any kind of roster um, with this being a personnel record center, all of our records are organized just alphabetically by the person rather than um, different like families or 
different like we we won't have for the Air Force we won't have like different areas specifically like this is everybody in Georgia or anything like that but just write in and request it and we will search it as thoroughly as we can and then give you a yes or no but definitely you can send in separate individual requests for every individual and we'll search for everybody that way we'll also if you let us know you're looking for members of your family if we find that there's mention of somebody else in the record we'll go ahead and search there if you let us know you want everybody from the family okay thank you next question do you have wasp records WASP yeah, women women air, women air service pilots yeah yeah we do okay and another one just came in my mother worked for the War Department during the war. She went to work for State Department after that, and then the GPO after that. She worked until the 1960s. Would that be all one record? Yeah, most likely. Um, if there was a break in service, there's a chance that her old record wasn't pulled and put with the newer stuff. Um, we have, until the 1960s, we have some of those records here and what happens is if you write in the request to us then we will find everything that's archival and we'll send it totally with the non-archival material and then Valmeyer will process the rest of the request but you can write it into us initially and we'll search and make sure that there's not anything lingering in those other departments it's common that they were combined and put in one place at the end of the employment but if there's a break in service sometimes that's not always true so we try to be thorough, make sure you list every place that you think that person worked. We'll search all of those places. And then if you just tell us like, I want everything possible related to my relative, then we'll know, we'll search all of the areas and we'll look through the file and see if it refers to an older employment in a different agency. Um, and then since they worked into the 1960s, that's gonna make it non-archival. But like I said, we work really closely with Valmeyer and we'll get all the material and then send it to Valmeyer to finish the request. Okay, and your last question, um, which was asked in the previous session as well. How do we get the records? Do you digitize? Do we get photocopies? What happens? It'll be a photocopy. We don't digitize um, with the exception of there's a separate fee for photographs. If there's a specific photograph that you want, we'll send that to you um, on a CD-ROM. But besides that, we don't digitize them. We make a photocopy. And same thing for microfilm. Some of this... Some files may be found on microfilm rather than a physical file. And what we do is put it through the microfilm re reader and print out an image from the reader and send you that printed out copy. That's what's going to happen if you go to the research room as well. Okay, and these questions just keep popping on in. So here's one more. Would your records include the names of local women who were air raid captains for neighborhoods? Um... There's a chance that there'll be other people besides the one, like if you search for one individual, there's a chance that in that individual's file, there may be mention of other people that they worked with, but we don't have like a roster list. We just go by the individual. So you'd have to look for multiple individuals and we can find all of their files, but we don't have like a roster list. Is that answering the question? I think so. Thank you so much. That's the end of our question. Oops, one more. Okay. I would like to know about my father as an air raid warden in World War II. Where would I look? Um, if he was an air raid warden, it sounds like that's a military file to me. Um, if he worked in a civilian capacity, you can write to us and we'll process those. Um, I just want to let you know, like, these are, we have men and women files. I just focused on women for genealogy because they're a little bit harder to track sometimes. So I wanted people to know that we do have women's records here. Um, but yeah, we definitely have men's records. And if he worked in a civilian capacity um, through the Corps of Engineers or however he worked for the Department of Army, we'll have those records and you can write in to us for those. Okay, that truly was the last question. I'm turning this over now. Thank you so much, Kara. And now we have Andrea Matney. Absolutely. I would also like to add more. Have um, if she did not get to your question, please send an email to inquire.gov. Before we go on to a break, I would like to mention that we also have many more genealogy talks available on our YouTube playlist under the U.S. National Archives channel. 
Under the Know Your Records program, we continue to place new genealogy talks several times a month. Uh, we also have ones that go back from previous years. So I hope that you'll take the opportunity to uh, explore the other YouTube uh, presentations that we've done. They also have the presentation slides and their corresponding handouts. And uh, again, I'd like to also mention the messages that we got courtesy of the National Archives Foundation. Uh, we have three announcements. Using yeah. coupon code GEN15, G-E-N-1-5, uh, you can get 15% off your entire purchase at myarchivestore.org. Like, oh yeah, I'm fine. Next, if you go to the archivesfoundation.org slash giveaway, you can enter to win a $200 gift card for myarchivestore.org. Last, as you've heard, we're doing a selfie contest. And since we have one presentation left, and we're hoping to get a few more, uh, if you use Twitter, you can take a picture of yourself participating in the fair, tag at US Nat Archives, and hashtag GenFair2015, and you can win a genealogy prize pack from the Archives Foundation store. We will now have an intermission. Tune in at 2 p.m. Eastern time for our last session of the day. Thank you. If you would be so kind as to uh, shut down your presentation and log out. Now, one thing I could have tried. Eight. Dot. Seven. Zero. Dot. Seven. Seven. Dot. Two. Four. Two.
Welcome to session number 10 and the last one of the 2015 Virtual Genealogy Fair. For our final lecture, we offer broke but not out of luck, exploring bankruptcy records for genealogy research by Jessica Hopkins. The United States bankruptcy records contain a wealth of details that can be found in few, if any, other place. These facts can include items owned by an individual or company, as well as a listing from whom they borrowed. This session will look at the bankruptcy records available, what type of information can be found, and demonstrate how to research the records. Ms. Hopkins is an archivist with the National Archives at Kansas City, Missouri. I am now turning the broadcast over to Jessica Hopkins. Thank you for the introduction, and also thank you for the team of individuals that are working to make the Virtual Genealogy Fair a success. Thank you to everyone who is listening online. As a reminder, handouts for the presentation are available online at the National Archives Virtual Genealogy Fair webpage. Note that at the end of the handout that's um, available online, you also have some sample reproductions. So if what you're seeing on your screen isn't uh, large enough, some of the um, key ones I've used at the very end, um, knowing that it's nice to sometimes have a full size. If you have questions during the presentation, you can pose them on Twitter using the hashtag GenFair2015. Questions can also be sent to inquire at nara.gov, and you can also post questions on the YouTube channel as we go along today. So broke but not out of luck, exploring bankruptcy records is the final session of this year's fair. It is a topic that uh, requires you to have a sufficient level of background information on the individual or company that you're investigating, as there is no master index to all the bankruptcy records from the United States courts. But the information found in these records can help address five key questions in your research, who, what, when, where, and how. But bankruptcy case files are unique because they also help us to dig into the question of why. Why did perhaps somebody file for bankruptcy? Slide four, please. So what do Edgar Allan Poe, the poet, Edwin Booth, the actor, Matthew Brady, the Civil War photographer, and Buffalo Bill Cody, and Walt Disney all have in common? Hopefully this rhetorical question isn't too difficult to answer, but they each individually or, part, or as part of a company were involved in a bankruptcy case. So on the screen is a reproduction of documents from Disney's bankruptcy, from the Disney bankruptcy, from his first business venture, which was Lathagram Films, based in Kansas City, Missouri. The level of detail is unlike many other records. Disney, while still living and working in the Kansas City area, had charged purchases to Franz Worm Hardware and Paint Company. These charges include nails, to rubber hoses, to lamp wire, and we can see those fees and Franz Worm is trying to get those, um, those charges repaid by Disney. Next slide, number five. So on your screen are featured three more documents from Walt Disney's file from his bankruptcy with Lafagram. These show the variety of information that could be discovered. He was past due on his electric bill with Kansas City Power and Light, the local electric utility company, still in existence today. We can even see what his meter readings were in May and June of 1923. The document on the far left is actually two pieces that have been glued together in the upper right-hand corner is where we find the glued pieces. If you were to lift up the slip with the header, Motion Picture News Incorporated, you would see that the record below is from the state of New York and the county of New York. This information provides a link to additional documents that you may want to pursue. So after Disney um, files for bankruptcy, he actually leaves Missouri. He heads to California. It is there where he becomes the successful film um, and entrepreneur that we know today. It's a great story of if you, at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Note the entire Disney bankruptcy case file is available in the National Archives online catalog. So hopefully these sample documents um, will whet your appetite a little bit for what you could possibly find. Slide six. Today's objectives include 
um, you want to be able to briefly describe the federal bankruptcy history. The history shapes the records that are available for research. It also helps to explain some of the nuances that you may encounter while researching bankruptcy case files. This is a very high-level overview of, of history, of economic history in the United States, and hopefully it will give you a little bit of um, vocabulary to go explore the more if this topic interests you. I also want you to know what records are available. The case files are arranged by case number based on which court created them and they're under by which act. And that's an important piece to keep in mind. And I want you to understand how to research the records. And this is a two-step process, first to locate the case number and second to request the file. This is a different process than utilizing an online subscription-based genealogy research tool or website or index. Because of the volume of bankruptcy materials, we can't, the National Archives cannot digitize everything and we cannot digitize all the indexes related to the bankruptcy case files. So the process that I'm going to describe requires that you have that research foundationally in order to perform the first step in, in order to get to the second step. As a reminder, we are focusing on federal bankruptcy acts and the case files that were made as a result of that. The National Archives maintains historically significant records that were created by federal agencies. Next slide, please. So as we think about bankruptcy acts in the United States, we need to keep in mind the, the national context of the United States. And we've had as many as 47 recessions in, in the United States since 1790. If I were to pull the audience about the causes, you would probably compile a list similar to what is on the screen. War, natural disasters, financial bubbles, foreign and domestic policy. Perhaps your list would have even more granularity. The four bankruptcy acts that we will touch on today are a result of the government reacting to many of these causes for economic downturn. Next slide, please. So as we look at the Bankruptcy Acts, it's important to remember that Congress has the authority um, under the Constitution to make uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcy. And we can see the four acts that we're going to talk about today, the Bankruptcy Act of 1800, the Bankruptcy Act of 1841, the Bankruptcy Act of 1867, and the Bankruptcy Act of 1898. And these acts provide regulation, regulation and standardization about what is permissible in court for bankruptcy, who is eligible, and under what conditions. Next slide, number nine. So let's dig into a little bit of the history of the Bankruptcy Act of 1800. It's caused by the Panic of 1797 by land speculation, the bubble bursts. Then we have the deflation of the Bank of England and a quasi-war with France. And the law is written based on what was the law in England at the time. So we see if we were to do a comparison of the laws in the United States and the laws of England, we would find um, many commonalities. The application of the law in the United States for the Bankruptcy Act of 1800 is limited to merchants. It also is involuntary bankruptcies bankruptcies only, and these are the legal proceedings in which a person or business is requested to go into bankruptcy by creditors rather than on the person's own accord or on the business's own accord. The creditors seeking involuntary bankruptcy must petition the court to initiate the proceedings, and the indebted party can file um, an objection if they dispute the charges at hand. So the effect of this is that it's actually repealed in 1803, so it's on the book for only three years. The, the repeal came as a result of um, abuse, um, and so they decided that we would go and have the states operate their own sort of bankruptcy system in the absence of federal law. Next slide, number 10. So the Bankruptcy Act of 1841 is, a, is caused by um, the Panic of 1837, a massive bank failure. You have the collapse of cotton markets. And this act um, allows for voluntary bankruptcies in addition to involuntary. You also, a debtor could file for bankruptcy and receive discharge of debt, and any individual could be a debtor. So the effects of this act, 
The creditors viewed the act as providing too few payments and discharging too many debtors. The act was repealed in 1843, only two years after it was passed. So it stays on the books even less time. Slide 11. So as we look at the causes that brought about the Bankruptcy Act of 1867, it's important to note that the United States is coming off the um, Civil War, and so there's a recession that follows the economic devastation involved with the Civil War. You have international financial instability. The Act actually allows for involuntary bankruptcy of any individual, and courts appointed uh, registers in bankruptcy to help alleviate the judge's caseload. And so when you go through case files from this time period, you'll see the judge's signature and the referee's, or the register's signature or the referee's signature. And then you'll see both of them are, are sometimes adding documents to the case file as well. And then the effect of this act. It suffered many of the same problems as the previous acts, and it gets repealed after 11 years. Slide 12. It's not until 1898 that we actually get some long-lasting bankruptcy laws. And this is really the bulk of what the materials that I'm speaking about today fall into, is the Bankruptcy Act of 1898. And that's because it was on the books for well over 80 years, or oh, for 80 years. And the causes of the, that brought about the Bankruptcy Act of 1898 is the massive, um, it was the massive panic of 1893 caused by the failure of the Reading Railroad, withdrawal of European investment. The application of the law allows for involuntary bankruptcy for any individual, as well as voluntary, and anyone owing $1,000 or more could be adjudged in an involuntary bankruptcy. And this effect is it actually lasts until 1978. By 1978, it is then replaced by a Bankruptcy Reform Act. So as such, today's presentation will focus on case files that are prior to 1978. So to use a little bit of framing to limit our conversation today. Slide 13. So as we have now talked a little bit about the history of the Bankruptcy Acts, and remember we talked at a, at a very high level, let's talk a little bit about what could be contained in those case files. We saw some samples, but here's a nice list on your screen. They can include motions. Um, they can include briefs and opinions, petitions, arguments, court orders, and more. And this is um, not going to be found in every single case file, but this is just a sample of what you could possibly find. Slide 14. So the terms used in bankruptcy um, may be foreign to researchers. The U.S. courts have created a useful dictionary that can help us navigate these waters. And I've just pulled two definitions onto the screen as a sample, but the website uh, found on your screen, uscourts.gov, um, has quite a few more that are just equally as useful. So when you look at a bankruptcy, you will most frequently find a schedule, and it's a detailed list filed by the debtor along with the petition showing the debtor, debtor's assets, liabilities, and other financial information. So the granularity of financial details that you can get from the Schedule A is unlike any other record available for genealogy research. Then if you look through a bankruptcy case file, you'll see the word trustee throughout the file. And it's actually a representative of uh, the bankrupt who exercises statutory power, principally for the benefit of the unsecured creditors. And the trustee is supervised by the court. And the trustee... Um, reviews the debtor's petition, schedules, and brings actions against the creditor or debtor to recover property of the bankrupt. Slide 15. So let's look at some examples. In addition to what you, say, what you see on your screen today, um, there are select copies in your handouts. Take note that some of the details um, on these forms that I'm going to be showing you are, are standardized government forms. The forms, um, much like those found when researching the U.S. federal census, provide clues about how and why uh, we as researchers may find certain pieces of information on a document and not others. So pay attention to your government forms um, if you are going to pursue this type of research. Slide 16. This is a sample of a standardized form, a Schedule A, 
uh, for a listing of unsecured creditors. Note the types of credits, amounts, locations, and dates. So if I was establishing a timeline um, for understanding a certain um, company that goes bankrupt or for an individual that goes bankrupt, these would be really helpful in understanding how did the person end up at this point. From this, we learned that there was a charge at the grocery store, a mortgage on the furniture, and charges for the services of a doctor and dentist. As a good detective, we are always looking for intersecting pieces of information. Does the charge for doctor services coincide with a birth, sickness, or death in the family, or something else? Slide 17. What you see on your screen is an is an application for the rejection of burdensome, burdensome property. I question actually how burdensome the property is since the mares had been given names, Blackie, Nance, Avis, and Sis. And these mares would be used to help pay down the debt of this particular farmer. Slide 18. This petition comes from the case involving William F. Cody, more commonly known as Buffalo Bill Cody. He had entered into a business venture with Pawnee Bill in 1908. Together, they owned and operated a traveling show called Buffalo Bill's Wild West and Pawnee Bill's Great Far East. In this petition, Cody is trying to differentiate between what is shared property as part of the business venture and his personal property that should be looked at separately. He wanted all the property that was in this joint business venture to be used to pay back debt first. In wanting to keep his own property, he notes that he wants to keep the box containing silver-mounted saddle and hair brush. He also uh, wants to keep the one buckskin suit and together with other purely personal effects belonging to him. And the court does note, according um, to this, the referred items are exempt from levy and sale based on the court order. Slide 19. Slide 19 features another Schedule A for, and this one actually talks about back taxes owed. So this is different than what we saw. This does not use the standard government form, but it still captures some of the same details. So by zooming in on this document, we find that this particular individual that had filed for bankruptcy had not paid their taxes from 1890 to 1895. We would need to check with the County Historical Society or Genealogical Society or even perhaps the Nebraska State Archives about researching the records of Madison County where these back taxes are due to see if maybe there's a, another corresponding record that contains similar information. But again, great granularity of detail, but also another jumping off point for additional, additional research. Slide 20. Okay, so this is a unique example of one of the amendments that is added to the Bankruptcy Act of 1898. And it, these um, case files are often called the Fraser lemke case files, named after the amendment that was added. And it involves farmers seeking relief during the Dust Bowl and Great Depression. So you can see um, the size of his property. We can see the legal land description. We can see that... Um, he had a lot of implements, cord binders, planters, and so on. Okay. The last sample that I wanted to show you brings us full circle. It comes from the Lathogram Film Company again. This schedule lists the creditors with their name, address, and amount loaned. If you're from Kansas City, you may recognize the name and location of the, of the uh, people and places listed here. If you are a Disney aficionado, you may notice the name of uh, Oob Eworks. He was an illustrator that worked closely with Disney and uh, is well known for his skills in uh, film special effects. But obviously Disney owed Oob um, money as well. Slide 22. Let's talk a little bit about the research methodology for these records. This being a more advanced research topic, know that there aren't a lot of indexes available online. 
and there's very few online resources for this. So you're going to need to have your foundational research um, at a fairly good point before you dive into this because you're going to use newspaper articles to investigate this. You're going to use family lore. You're going to consider maybe related court cases. And you're going to look for changes in property or location between census years. So when you're looking at the newspaper articles, I've got a sample here on this screen for slide 22. And this was a, a, a blip that would have run in the Kansas City Star. The clipping was then clipped uh, into Disney's bankruptcy case file. But if I were to do my newspaper research, I'd probably come across this in the context of the rest of the newspaper. When you consider family lore, you're trying to um, find the grains of truth amongst um, some of those stories that have been passed down for generations. When you're looking through the related court cases, you might find more easily, um, as compared to researching a bankruptcy, that maybe somebody went to criminal court, uh, or maybe they served time in a penitentiary. And sometimes in those uh, documents, documenting the criminal case or the time in the penitentiary, it will reference other types of um, issues that are being encountered by the person or the business in which they owned or operated. So, for example, if you think about the um, economic impact of the Great Depression, if a farm, for example, goes bankrupt and the farmer is left um, needing to feed his family, perhaps he turns to a life of crime to help provide for his family. That one's a little bit of, um, it's probably more the exception than the rule. And then the last thing, the changes in property or location between census years. In the example of Walt Disney, he's actually in the United States Federal Census, living in Kansas City, Missouri, when you look at the 1920 census. By 1930, he has moved to California. By 1940, he is still in California, and that's actually the first census where it asks about the um, wealth of a particular individual, and we find out that he's doing quite well by the time the 1940 census rolls around. But that drastic change in geographic location in uh, Walt Disney's life helps me to narrow in on a certain time frame. By 1920, he's in Kansas City. By 1930, he's in California. So it gives me a 10-year scope of something happened, it elicited change, and now he's moved, he's moved west. So perhaps something like that has happened in uh, your family research as well. Slide 23. Successful bankruptcy research requires three equal parts. You need to know the time frame, the party or parties involved, and the geographical area in which the bankruptcy would have been filed. These three details work together to help you identify the case number. The court filed these all by case number. It would have been a significant amount of work for the court to arrange them all by last name. So the case numbers is how you will find them. So these three pieces, time frame, party involved, and geographical area, um, all work together. And think of it like a three-legged stool. They all need to be equally supporting your research. And if you're struggling with identifying one of these three pieces of information, you need to take a step back and perform a little bit more foundational research um, before moving forward. By using these three categories, you will be able to use the National Archives um, online catalog and some paper-based finding aids to further um, investigate this topic. Next slide, 24. So when you start your research, because you, you've got enough information to move forward, you're going to be utilizing finding aids. And finding aids are the tools created to help access the materials that you're interested in. And finding aids vary from archive to archive, from museum to museum. And they vary based on who created them, why they were created, and um, the level of detail. So if you think about maybe the subscription-based genealogy websites that you use, it's full of finding aids, which are indexes, indexes at the name level. Given the volume of bankruptcy case files, 
we don't have a digital name index. But the court, in realizing that when they were producing the records as part of these cases, that they needed access on a daily basis, they would produce certain indexes. So we're going to talk a little bit in detail about the finding aids produced by the federal court. So one of those is a case index list. So it can list all the bankruptcy cases or all of the cases tried by that court. So you might find an index that is mixed with bankruptcy court or bankruptcy case file actions, um, criminal case actions, civil case file actions, equity case actions, and so on. So as you go through your case index, you want to watch out for that, the variations. And a, and a skilled archivist can help you navigate those waters. The indexes can also be direct and inverted, which means um, sometimes you search by the plaintiff, and they're organized alphabetically by that, or sometimes they're by the defendant. But note that the indexes can be incomplete. They were compiled by the clerk of the court. So some are very good, some are mediocre, and some are very poor or um, non-existent. So if there's no case index, then you switch to a docket book, and they contain brief notes stating what actions um, were taken on a particular day in court. And it's usually highlighting some of the big um, ticket items. When was the petition filed? When is the order filed? But you get a good overall time frame of when uh, the, the court would have been hearing the case. And this doc these docket books, are um, each book is arranged by the case number. And they would have been... Um, added to throughout the case um, and sometimes after the fact as well. Slide 25. Finding aids created by the court part two. So if you don't have success in the indexes or the docket books, you're going to be considering journal or minute books. And these document day-to-day -day proceedings, so everything that happened in the court on that particular day. So you're going to need to search by a particular date or date range to find your case number. This is much more time intensive than looking at your docket book. Your journal and minute book, though, can give you the context of what else is going on in the court if that interests you. And then finally, your final record book is a compilation of case proceedings. It contains information that may not be found in the case file. So that's kind of your final finding aid that you might pursue. Now, these finding aids that I'm talking about um, very few, of, if any, are digital. So if you're going to be doing bankruptcy case file research, you're going to first need to work with um, a location of the National Archives about accessing these finding aids. And then you'll get the case file, and then you'll be able to order the actual file itself. Slide 26. So let's look at this sample docket that is now on slide 26. These are two pages from the same docket book. We find out, if we look at the one on the left of your screen, it's for a Robert Tarrant. He submitted bankruptcy voluntarily. He was an engineer at Pratt Whitney. We get his address, and we get um, different actions within the court. Notice that this is in 1944. If you've been doing your research for a while, Hopefully a light bulb went off. I'm getting his address in a record post-1940. The 1940 census is the most uh, current one that we can access. So to get a record that is post-1940 with an address is nice because then we have another piece to add to our timeline of understanding of this individual's lifetime and where he lived and what he was up to answering those five key questions of who, what, when, where, and how. If we look at the one on the right side of your screen, it's for uh, Jake W. Rose. Again, we get his address. We find out that he was a laborer at the Standard Steel Company, and he um, was in bankruptcy voluntarily. In his case, um, a little bit shorter comparatively, but again, we get his address in 1944 right during World War II. 
slide 27. So now that we've talked about the finding aids created by the court, and remember, the finding aids created by the court are generated by the court. They weren't generated with researchers in mind necessarily. So they were created by the court for a function of the court. So when we research them, we keep that in mind. So our finding aids are indexes, journals, minute books, and final record books um, are all kind of together, and we, we can look at those. We can also look at our dockets. But those are spread throughout the National Archives um, throughout the country, and it's dependent on the location of the court. And this is why um, when we talked earlier, to do this research, you need the three equal parts, time frame, geographic location, and you also need the party or parties involved because the finding aids is going to require you to work with one of the National Archives branches um, throughout the United States. So, for example, if somebody files for bankruptcy at the National Archive, or at the, filed for bankruptcy in the uh, federal courts in Denver, you're going to want to contact the National Archives in Denver for, to figure out what types of indexes, um, journal and minute books, and dockets that they have uh, for bankruptcy actions during that time frame. So let's think about it in another one. If somebody filed for bankruptcy in somewhere in Ohio, we're going to need to make a contact with the National Archives in Chicago. The National Archives in Chicago um, receives material from federal agencies in Ohio. And so then they will help you to figure out indexes journals and minute books, final record books, and dockets that are available uh, for the courts in Ohio. Once you've been able to utilize those resources by working um, at a distance or maybe making a research visit, then you'll be able to contact the National Archives at Kansas City for the case file. All bankruptcy case files are stored at the National Archives at Kansas City. So once you have the case file, you're, it's smooth sailing because then we can look at the file on your behalf and provide reproductions, or you're welcome to visit our research room to look at the case file as well. So this is speaking to the two-step process that is required of researching bankruptcy case files. Slide 28. This is a screenshot of the National Archives online catalog. It's going to operate similar to many other search engines that you are probably familiar with. But when you're researching in this catalog, there are some key terms that you want to use. Next slide, slide 29. So you want to use the term bankruptcy act. You want to maybe use the word case file. You want to use dockets. You don't want to use case files and dockets together. You want to, because case files are stored separately from the dockets. They're not lumped in one group. You could search by the, you could add the phrase district court um, or bankruptcy court. Or you could add um, the state in which the bankruptcy was filed. I would not recommend adding the city in which you believe it was filed in the event that there wasn't a federal court located in that city. So, this is your opportunity to think like an archivist and to um, think about how um, these case files and supporting finding aids would be categorized and found in the catalog. The catalog is not a name index. So if you think about um, records like a funnel, you think about at the very tip of the funnel, you've filtered uh, pretty significantly and you've gotten down to just a couple of names. Maybe uh, that's your item level. And then if you go up in the funnel, you broaden out just a little bit, maybe you get a spectrum of files. And then we open up just a little bit more and we're, the catalog is really going to be at that third level up. Um, that's where we're going to see our most success. So your search tips will not yield a specific case but gives you the tools to go about finding that case. You should include the state, and it provides a stepping stone for your research. Slide 30. So in the National Archives catalog, 
we've, you can see that on your screen again, I've input a sample search. So I've put Bankruptcy Act in quotations. I've added which year my, my case file would fall under, and then my geographic reference of New York. So if I was interested in a bankruptcy from um, 1841 or 1842, I would actually input Bankruptcy Act 1841 into my search bar and then frame my search around that because the case files are grouped based on the act. So that's why that history, at least even a minimal understanding of the history, is really important because the case files are grouped based on the act. So let's go ahead and run the search. Next slide, number 31. On your screen you can see a sample of what um, the results page looks like. And notice I have 16 results. And this is a wide spectrum of results. So um, I'm getting everything from some series descriptions to some web pages and some articles. All of this can be good information. If you're just starting this, you know, if you have a, a hit that comes up that says Prologue article, Prologue is the, uh, a publication of the National Archives, and I would recommend reading a little bit there because then it gives you a little bit more uh, understanding of the topic as a researcher. So there's that. The way that I would recommend navigating through this page is using your left-hand side. Your left-hand side gives you a lot of different refinement options. I would avoid using the refine by date at this point. It's not going to produce the results that you expect. There's a lot of other controls that are um, more useful to you at this point. So earlier I mentioned how things in the catalog are arranged kind of like a funnel, and we're trying to get that middle level in the funnel. Well, that middle level in the um, description of archival records of the National Archives is called a series, and the best way to think of that is just a grouping um, in the most simple of terms. And so we're going to actually click on series, slide 32, and our, our result list becomes much shorter. We now have six. And as you look at this list, we've, we've kind of put our filters on and we're seeing more specificity. We can see the different groupings, the different series of case files. So we can see Bankruptcy Act, 1898 case files. Um, the date that these records start is uh, January 1st, 1901, and the last dated record is December 31st of 1939. We can see um, on that very same one who created the record, the U.S. District Court for the Western District of New York. Notice that there's no city reference in there, and that's why um, city isn't always, a, it isn't always helpful for us, depending on how the creator, and the creator is who created the record. So in this case, for this presentation, the U.S. court generated all these records that we're talking about. So as we go through the list, if you look at the very bottom of the list, we happen to hit an interesting thing, Index to Bankruptcy Act of 1898 case file. 1898 through 1929, and we can notice the creator, it's the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of New York. Now this index is only for the Northern District. It's not going to be for the Western District that we saw as the very first hit. This is only for the Northern. So let's actually look at the index and see what that, that link looks like. Slide 33. So before we even do that, we're going to note important details that we're going to be paying attention to as we look at that description. We're going to look at the title and date. We're going to look at the National Archives Identifier, which is an, a numeric value. We're going to look at the creator. We're going to look at the scope and content, and we're going to look at the context. Slide 34. So we can see all of those pointed out on the screen. So our title and our date, Index to Bankruptcy Act of 1898 Case Health. And the index spans 1898 through 1929. Notice the line below, it's got a triangle next to it. Um, it's on the screen, it's a very small triangle. It says, this series contains records, some of which may not be available online. Notice that there's no link to any additional things on this page um, that jump us off that says, look at the index here, or 
anything with that type of verbiage. So based on that, we know that we're going to have to make a, a research request. Moving to number two, the National Archives Identifier. You can give that number to a National Archives employee, and we can pull this up in the catalog, and we can see exactly what you're talking about and answer those questions specifically related to that item, which is, is very convenient for both the researcher and uh, for the staff member helping you. Uh, the third thing that we need to know is the creator. So this, is, this index is created by the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of New York. The next thing we're going to look at is the scope and content. And this gives you a little bit of information about what you could possibly find. And it says, this series consists of an index to bankruptcy case files initiated in the U.S. District Court. And then the last item that we're going to um, note is the contacts. And we notice the address for the National Archives in New York, but then we also get the phone and email address. So if we wanted to inquire about the research process, um, to learn more about this particular uh, set of volumes, we could then make our, make our inquiry. Slide 35. So I just wanted to show another um, description for bankruptcy. Uh, case, this is for case files, so this is separate than the index. These case files are 1901 to 1939. And you can see that this one has more information as compared to the index that we saw earlier. And it's not going to be very clear on your screen, but I do want to point it out um, kind of in the middle of the screenshot that you can see. There's a section called Function and Use. And if you come across records that have this type of description, it can be helpful because it gives you context to understand why the court generated what they did and the purpose of the records. And so you can understand, okay, this is why the court was um, maybe filing things the way they were or what types of expectations I should have about these records. So there was too much in this description to actually fit on one screen, so we'll advance to slide 36. And we get the scope and content, which is um, much more robust than the one we saw earlier, but it's because it's um, for uh, records that are much more voluminous and have have many more uh, pages to them. So we can see the sample of, again, what we could possibly find in the case file. Um, and it talks about um, other nuances in the records that you might encounter. So as we come to kind of the close of this presentation, I wanted to leave you with a few online resources in addition to um, exploring the catalog and um, the definitions that I provided earlier. So you've got three on your screen, and there are select bankruptcy records on microfilm. Um, those microfilm publications um, can be available, and you can research those on archives.gov, our website. And there's also uh, important information produced by the bankruptcy um, and district courts as well, and you'd want to check those out. Once you've identified the case file by um, working through indexes or dockets um, with one of the other National Archives branches, then you can contact the National Archives of Kansas City and request the case file. And um, we will respond quickly and hopefully help you further your research. At this point, I will open it up to questions, and the National Archives of Kansas City contact information is on the screen as well as our telephone number. And thank you so much for your time. So much. Thank you so much, Jessica. We have about seven or eight questions. The first one is, do I have to know that a specific individual actually filed for bankruptcy in order to be able to get the information? How would I find out? So the question about, do I need to know if a specific individual filed for bankruptcy um, in order to research the bankruptcy case files? You need to at least make sure you have a narrowed a time frame, a geographic reference, and then the name. Once you have those three pieces, then you can start to um, dig into those finding aids that I mentioned and, and determine is the name found in the index, in the time frame, and in the uh, geographic area that I expect. And you'd want to look at those newspaper articles um, to look for indication of bankruptcies. Those were um, always the one stipulation of bankruptcy 
required that um, the announcement be put in the paper so that way creditors or um, anybody that was owed money could then make a statement saying, Bob Smith owes me $20 um, in court. And so the, the newspaper clipping um, that I showed earlier is that announcement of saying, hey, creditors, <laughs> um, if you have uh, fees owed by this individual, time now is your time to speak up and bring it to the court. Um, so you're going to be looking for details like that. But you're going to need to do a little bit of preliminary digging before jumping into the uh, bankruptcy case files. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question, is the relocation of the federal bankruptcy case files on schedule and will they be available after November 12th, 2015 in Kansas City? Actually, very exciting news. We have moved the last bankruptcy that was to be relocated last Friday. So the bankruptcy move is now officially done. So all uh, requests are open and can be received at the National Archives of Kansas City. Next question. Would a 1929 small business bankruptcy in Ohio necessarily have been a federal bankruptcy? And the same question about 1962. From what I understand, it would, a, a bankruptcy filed by a small business in 1929 and then um, perhaps a different one or the same one in 1962 would have been filed at the federal level. So you want to do your uh, detailed finding aid research through the National Archives in Chicago as they provide access to those finding aids generated by the court. And then once you have that information come to the National Archives via email or um, on the phone, to request the case file. And I will say with um, people interested in re researching the case files, once they get to that point, they will need to uh, make an appointment to visit the National Archives at Kansas City if they plan to, to come in person to view things. Um, with any sort of archival research, um, letting, us, letting the archival um, office know that you're coming helps to make for a more successful research visit for all. Um, but given the time frame of the 1929 and the 1962, you would want to search uh, through the federal records to see what you could find. Okay, thank you. Next question. What about people who were living in territories? Would the bankruptcy information be in the same place as ones filed in the states? So this is a question related to the uh, federal jurisdiction in territorial areas. In some instances, territorial information does come into the National Archives. In other instances, uh, information from the territorial courts ends up um, in a state archive, and it's on a state-by-state -state basis. So I would encourage you to do a little bit of research to figure out where did the territorial records um, for the geographic area of interest end up. So are they in the state archives or are they in the um, National Archives with the federal documentation? And I can think of multiple examples um, here in the Midwest where um, territorial papers ended up here at the National Archives, but then the state also has some. So there, you might also run into that scenario. So you'll have to do um, a little bit of uh, detective work to figure out um, that. But there's no standard answer for that. Thank you. Next question, were there any crossovers between bankruptcy and criminal cases, and where would these dockets end up for intrastate commerce? Um, was being processed at the same time. You would essentially have two um, separate files generated on each action, but there would be interconnected um, paperwork maybe referencing the other. So when you're looking at your bankruptcy case file, it might reference the criminal action and vice versa. And it's also good if that happens to note the dates of when those are happening. Are they happening in tandem or are they happening one and then the other? Because um, that could also be an interesting point of reference um, to understand what's going on in the person or business um, that you're researching. Now for the docket books, there's docket books that are generated 
for bankruptcy. There are docket books created for civil cases. There's docket books created for criminal cases. So the court kept all of those um, separate for the most part. So when you're doing your research into those different types of case files, you'd want to make sure you're zeroing in on the dockets that um, are for the type of proceeding that you're researching. So if you're researching the criminal case files, you're going to be researching in the criminal docket. Same thing with bankruptcy, bankruptcy dockets. Now, the one exception or a couple of exceptions may be um, the journal and minute books. Journal and minute books, because they give the day-to-day um, operations of the court that give details on everything, you're going to find all the different types of proceedings mixed in with one another because the judge might hear a criminal case in the morning, then um, maybe bankruptcy that afternoon or, or something of that sort. So the journal and minute books are more integrated um, in those you search by time frame. But your docket books, because they're by case file number and the case file um, is assigned uh, numerically and it is done um, for all the bankruptcy case files. All have running sequence numbers. Then the criminal case files have all the running sequence. So you might you'll have bankruptcy case one two three, and you'll also have criminal case one two three, each involving um, a different entity. Next question: Do you have bankruptcy files for the Confederate government during the Civil War? Or should I check with the state archives for that? So bankruptcy files for the Civil War for the Confederates, I would check with your state at that point. During this time frame, um, during the Civil War, there is no federal bankruptcy um, legislation. So each state is responsible for um, still overseeing the processes of debtors seeking relief and creditors seeking money. So you'd want to look and see what are the state um, regulations at that point. And it, it gets a little bit gray because um, there's certain things the states couldn't do um, in the courts because they're limited by um, federal jurisdiction. But um, you'd want to check with the uh, state in which you're interested in for that type of record. Okay, thank you. Next question. Is there a privacy date, or are all records prior to 1978, as mentioned, publicly available? All records prior to 1978 are open. All court records, are, all records generated by the court are open for research. Um, there is no privacy stipulation for bankruptcy case files specifically. Um, so you can research them without any sort of restriction, um, given the time frame that I have given in today's presentation. Okay, thank you. And final question, would the bankruptcy filings be located in the courts near the business which failed or in the courts near the creditors? So the bankruptcy, the, so the question about where would the bankruptcy have been filed, is it based on where the business was located um, geographically or is it based on where the creditors were located geographically? Generally, it's where the business would have been located because if you think back to the sample that we saw for Lathergrams, Walt Disney's company, he had creditors from throughout the country. He had creditors in the um, Midwest, but then he also had some on the East Coast. But the bankruptcy was filed here because his business was here. So when you're doing your research, you want to figure out where is the business because the creditors um, can come from all over the country. And there are always going to be exceptions. So I would say that if, if you come across um, too many roadblocks when you're seeking the business, uh, seeking the information based on the location of the business, um, then maybe you switch to the creditors. But that, I, I would say, as a very, very last, <laughs> last effort in trying to locate that file because it's probably not going to be successful to go through the creditors. But you want to go through the business that filed for bankruptcy. Microphone to Diane Dimkoff. Good afternoon and wow, whew. Um, this concludes, as Andrea said, the 2015 Genealogy Fair. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for tweeting, for chatting, for posting your selfies, and even 
everything else. We love all of the pictures you sent us. We love our genealogists. So if you missed a lecture, the videos and handouts will remain available on the FAIR website. Thank you for helping make this a huge success for the National Archives. If you still have lingering questions, you can email us at inquire at nara.gov. We've given that address to you a few hundred times, but you can still write into to us if you still have more questions. We will now have closing remarks. I'm pleased to welcome to the stage my boss, Bill Mayer. He's the National Archives Executive for Research Services. And thanks again, Bill. Thank you, Diane. Hello, Internet. Thank you all for participating in this year's virtual genealogy fair. By all accounts, it's been a smashing success. In the first day alone, we reached 39 countries, 3,800 <coughs> excuse me, 3,800 views just in the first day. That's amazing. There's no way we could have brought this much content to so many people in so many places if we hadn't done it virtually. I am truly impressed and pleased, and thanks to your enthusiasm and involvement, the research services staff at NARA will keep working to provide you the insight to the past these records can reveal for all citizens of the world, and in the most innovative and accessible ways possible. My sincere thanks to all of our presenters. Each session showed you a glimpse of the excellent staff we have here at NARA, and I'm grateful for their dedicated service whether it be online, in the stacks, or on the research rooms. I also want to thank Diane Dimkoff, Andrea Matney, and Kathy Lumi, the architects behind this year's, this year's fair. And finally, last and definitely not least, the technology staff across NARA who have collaborated again to provide our audience with real-time access to our content, regardless of where the user is sitting. Yesterday and today have truly been global experiences. Keep in mind we will archive these presentations online at the archives.gov site, the best place to start your connections with the National Archives. Keep coming back often. We'll look forward to working with you next time and have a wonderful day. Thank you all.